we need to talk about series moving towards gender equity in architecture. As Alan said, I'm Leora Vysotsky, the Managing Director of the Center for American Architecture and Design. I'll be as brief as possible today, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background on the event and introduce our student participants and our moderator, who will in turn introduce our invited guests. Uh, first, a couple of housekeeping items. I know many of you will have questions and comments to add. Um, we're going to have a short time carved out after each first and second session, so please hold those comments and questions until then, and Adam will make some time for you all. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that after the event at 5 p.m., the AIA Women in Architecture Committee will be uh, having a monthly meeting over at the Cactus, and we hope that you will join them there. The intent is for them to be there to continue the conversation um, and to have kind of an informal social hour with you to share share their experiences. So that's a great opportunity, and I, I hope you'll join them. Um, a few words of thanks. Um, first, I want to thank Dean Michelle Addington and Associate Deans Alan Scherer and Charlton Lewis for really helping shape the idea for the event and kind of for the direction that we wanted to take the dialogue and the narrative today. I want to thank uh, Kelsey Stein, our communications coordinator, for um, getting the word out to our community and media outlets. Thank you to Haley Algo and Carly Choi, who are two student employees who provided absolutely invaluable feedback in planning this event and basically did everything from designing the poster to helping me move furniture yesterday. Um, and finally, I want to thank the Austin Foundation for Architecture um, for sponsoring the event and for really challenging us to look at how, as designers, we can more positively shape our community and, in turn, our entire profession. Uh, our hope and our charge with this series is to discuss things that are difficult or uncomfortable, but that are also critical to address in our industry and our academies. We wanted to put together a dialogue today that would matter to current students right now, and for which discussion topics and tools would be immediately applicable to your own lives. We want students to be able to take from these talks a sense of the agency that you have now and that you can have in the future to affect your discipline and also to provide a platform for you to find and shape your voices around the issues that matter to you in design. To that end, the discussion today will include six students with our school's Race and Gender in the Built Environment fellow, Adam Miller, as the moderator, uh, to quickly introduce you to our student participants. Haley Algo, feel good Google Babe, is a Bachelor of Architecture student, also president of our student council. Lauren Boyd is a third year Bachelor of Architecture student. Michaela Garza is a fifth year Bachelor of Architecture student. Lynn Wynn is a third year Bachelor student majoring in Communications and Women's and Gender Studies. <clears throat> Sydney Landers is a Master's student in Historic Preservation. Erin McMurray is a third year Master of Architecture student. And now our moderator, Adam Miller. Adam is the 2019 Race and Gender in the Built Environment Fellow at the School of Architecture here at UT. His research investigates the relationship between aesthetics, power and identity for, via the lens of the queer body and queer architecture. Adam's interests lie in renegotiating the legacies of modern architecture and its taste culture by using queer theory, feminist theory, biopolitics, and aesthetics to develop design that takes marginalized perspectives into account. Adam is currently teaching two graduate and upper level undergraduate architecture courses and has previously taught at UC Berkeley. He's founding member of New Stars a collaborative design group that produces stage design and installations. As part of his research, he co-edited a volume of essays, interviews, and visual work for UC Berkeley's Architecture Journal Room 1000, interrogating the subject of the timeless in architecture. Corollary to the volume, Adam organized a lecture at Berkeley on queer architecture and color, and a graduate reading group session on queer studies and architecture. Adam asks, how does architectural style confer an aesthetic value system and how can we come to recognize and reappropriate its tools for proposing alternative ways of seeing, making, and identification? Please join me welcoming Adam Miller. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank Leora again because Leora has been putting immense work into this for long before I even came here. Um, and also thank you to the students, Haley, Lynn, 
Lauren, Michaela, Sydney, and Erin, who have been fundamental to the planning and conceptualization of the event and the workshopping of the discussion prompts. Each student involved in the planning is here today on the panel um, and will sit with the prompt of their choosing on the panel. To that end, each question was developed um, through workshop uh, with the students. To provide some context of the demographic state of architecture, a 2018 study from the San Francisco AIA, Equity by Design, the largest study of its kind, found that 46% of its respondents identified as female, 53% as male, and 1% as non-binary. Of those respondents, 80% were white, and 85-90% to were straight. However, we continue to lack any detailed statistics around those identifying as non-binary and gender non-conforming. However, looking at age, the demographics become significantly more female and more racially diverse the younger you look, suggesting that the future for the diverse leadership of our profession um, is possible if we can address the structural challenges along the way. The challenges we often face around gender expression are pertinent to us all, though not as often discussed. I'm grateful we are here today to broach these issues. I believe the ability to identify not only others like oneself, but also one's allies, directly affects the decision to pursue architecture in the first place, and once there, whether to stay in architecture. Our panel hopes to address experiences and challenges facing us all around gender expression and identity across career development. As a gay man, the weight of expectations around straight masculine performativity personally affects me. And as a cis white man, I believe we need to address the state of masculinity to locate positive models of what it might mean to be a man, cis or otherwise, within architecture and to establish new paradigms of what an architect can look like, act like, and design like. Each of our panelists has unique expertise and experience to share in the face of challenges around gender and identity in architecture. With that, I am excited to introduce our panelists, whom we are all very grateful to have here today. Grace Law, Shelby Doyle, Mabel O. Wilson, and Damon Leverett, and I will read their bios. So, going, to, going down the line, um, Shelby Doyle. Shelby Elizabeth Doyle, AIA, is a registered architect, co-founder of the ISU Computation and Construction Lab, and an assistant professor of architecture at Iowa State University, where she teaches design studios and seminars in digital technology. <coughs> the central hypothesis of Doyle's research and the CCL is that computation and architecture is a material, pedagogical, and social project. Computation is both informed by and productive of architectural cultures. This hypothesis is explored through the fabrication of built projects, writing, exhibition, and material exploration. The CCL is invested in questioning the role of education and pedagogy in replicating existing technological inequalities and in pursuing the potential for technology and architecture as a space of and for gender equity. Her education includes a Fulbright Fellowship to Cambodia, a Master of Architecture from Harvard GSD, and a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Virginia. Next we have Mabel O. Wilson. Mabel O. Wilson is the Nancy and George E. Rupp Professor in architecture and also a professor in African American and African Diasporic Studies at Columbia University. She has authored Begin with the Past, Building the National Museum of African American History and Culture from 2017, and Negro Building, African Americans in the World of Fairs and Museums from 2012. With her practice, Studio And, she is a collaborator in the architectural team designing the memorial to enslaved African American laborers at the University of Virginia. She's a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, a collective that advocates for fair labor practices on building sites worldwide. 
Next, we have Damon Leverett. Damon Leverett, MFA, AIA, NCARB, uh, NOMA, lead AP, is senior lecturer, College of Architecture Planning and Landscape Architecture, and adjunct instructor at the School of Information at the University of Arizona. He is formerly with the American Institute of Architects, where he served as managing director, workforce development and strategy in Washington, D.C., with duties in the areas of equity, diversity, inclusion, academic and K-12 engagement, and emerging professionals. In 2018, Damon was awarded the AIA Presidential Citation for his work in equity, diversity, and inclusion. Damon also holds an MFA in Web Design and New Media from the Academy of Art University in San Francisco and served as lecturer at Lawrence Technological University and the University of Illinois Schools of Architecture. He is currently director on the National Architectural Accrediting Board. A licensed architect in Arizona and Michigan, his former professional associations include Albert Kahn Associates, Smith Group, and EYP. Damon has been a member of the American Institute of Architects since 1986. And uh, next we have Grace Law. Grace Law is Professor of Architecture, Chair of the Practice Platform, and former Director of the Master of Architecture programs at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. She is also Principal of Law Dolman, co-founded with James Dolman. Law Dolman's work is internationally recognized for the integration of architecture, engineering, and landscape. Noted for works that expand the architect's agency in the civic recalibration of infrastructure, public space, and challenging sites, Law Dahlman has been awarded numerous professional honors and awards. Demonstrating unique ability to link the profession and the academy, Law's teaching, research, and design work have been recognized with numerous awards, including four ACSA faculty design awards. Law has delivered lectures at numerous universities and cultural institutions, and Law Dolman's work has been exhibited worldwide. The practice has been featured in many publications. Grace holds an MARC with thesis distinction from Harvard and held the Clifford Wong Housing Prize. She graduated AB Magna Cum Laude from Harvard College in Visual and Environmental Studies. With that, can we please get a round of applause for our participants? <laughs> There are six prompts, and we have about 30 minutes per prompt, around five to seven minutes per um, person to talk on this issue. So first we're going to um, start with this uh, question around background, um, and uh, we'll have Michaela um, join us at the panel now. So um, this is our first question. and. Uh, it reads, please provide a brief background on how you arrived at your current position in your career. What kind of unique challenges did you face when you entered academia and the profession? Can you speak to your personal experiences of the dynamics of power differentials in terms of gender and gender expression? So, whoever feels comfortable going first, um, <laughs> we can also, oh, Grace. Sure, at this end of the table. And it can, is that, it's a little hard to, so I thought that was a very interesting question. Thank you for conceiving of it. It's, um, it's always nice to, to allow one to think and situate um, in the background with one of one is today, so I appreciate that. Um, when I was in graduate school, um, I entered a class that was only, uh, there was probably about less than 10% women in my particular um, graduate school class at the GSD. <coughs> so it, uh, uh, immediately um, we recognized that we were a very, very small group, um, and after the first two weeks we, we lost one of our, uh, 
in colleagues. So we were in an even smaller group. Uh, this was only a, about a class of between 50 and 60 people, so it was very noticeable. Um, throughout the, that time in graduate school, I can say that um, I only had essentially one woman mentor in all of my time, uh, and that was Bridget Shin, um, who is a principal of Shin Sutcliffe and faculty at the University of Toronto. Um, she was the first, uh, let's say, the only role model um, that I had and that, um, who was generous enough to mentor me. Um, and then subsequently I had other mentors when I was um, in the academic world and teaching. Um, and most interestingly, I think it was fascinating for me to have mentors who were actually women outside of my department and outside of my school, which I think is an interesting topic to discuss. Um, but I will say that I had, I felt very lucky that um, despite the, the, let's say the few women mentors that I had, I did have a number of um, wonderful male mentors, um, uh, particularly in the profession. Uh, for whatever reason, they were very avuncular, and I, feel, I felt I really learned a lot. Where I didn't feel that I had um, very uh, good male mentors, and I think this was a challenge, um, was in academia. Um, so I think that's an interesting uh, surprise because you always imagine that the university is more erudite than the field. But when you uh, when you're on a job site, you worry that perhaps uh, gender issues would emerge. But in fact, they didn't emerge there. They actually emerged more um, more clearly in academia. Um, so I, I would just say that um, um, I'm so eager to hear what everyone else. Uh, has to say about this, but I thought it was, I think it's, I think it's interesting when I reflect on um, certain kinds of challenges, and I would say perhaps one of the largest is to find that mentor, male, female, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to find um, that person, but once you do, it's an incredible um, opportunity in a relationship. Thank you. Damon. <laughs> well, you talk about equity sometimes, like even this microphone is too low for me. It's sort of being tall was actually a problem. <laughs> that's, that was too close, you know. So this whole idea later we'll talk about is uh, universal design is something I take seriously because it affects people who, of all sizes, actually. It's another, another issue. Hey, uh, you know, when I went to high school, uh, it was 60% African American and 40% white. And, uh, and when I showed up to architecture school, first day, it was like 100 uh, people and only like two African Americans or something like that. And that was a huge culture shock for me. And I had, I had to figure that out. <laughs> because I was so determined to be an architect ever since I was probably six. So, um, I, you know, I was very determined, so nothing, you know, when we talk about obstacles, um, I was just such a determined person for so long by the time I got to architecture school, the beginning of my architecture journey and, and eventually becoming an architect, it was just nothing was gonna stop me, really, I felt. Um, even even such unknowns as, as culture, you know, which I, I really hadn't put my arms around that. Uh, so that was something that uh, that I, I think it was really on my mind quite a bit. But later on, I finished school, and uh, my biggest goal was to become licensed before I was thirty, and and I got my license when I was twenty-nine, and, and it's still I feel one of my, my biggest achievements. Over the years, I, I work for a big firm, so my perspective may be slightly different in a, in a sense that I work for someone my whole career, and uh, but I got to work on a lot of large projects. That's, that's basically my background. So when I got to a point where I could build a hospital, a 100-bed hospital, and all the technology and, and all the gadgets that go into that, I felt like... At about, it was about age 36 that I realized I could build a building. And that was sort of my second biggest goal. There was nothing I couldn't figure out how to build an architectural building after going through an experience like that because it's so complicated. Um, so 
That, that's part of it. And uh, the other thing I wanted, to, some of this question has to do with power differentials, so I want to kind of address that. And as I became a, a, a senior designer and eventually a design director, which has kind of been my, my role most of my career, I began to have employees who are both genders or uh, non-gender identity, all, all, all imaginable combination. And one of the things I noticed is that um, you know, a lot of times it's something subtle. It became sort of the battle, what I call the battle of ideas. And when I saw this gender interaction, I found that a lot of times males would try to out shout out the other person. So in other words, whoever could say it the loudest is the person whose idea <laughs> came to the forefront. And, uh, and I realized I uh, not only as a manager, I had to try to tone, tap that down, but it also began to have me look at myself. And I had to say that, you know, as you can see, I have a very booming voice. <laughs> so um, what, what do I do about that? So actually what I try to do is not use that voice in a destructive way. So I've spent a lot of the last few decades trying to keep my voice lower um, because I have a large voice box, but that doesn't mean my ideas are bigger because of that. So it's, a, it's part of active listening that I found really important. And I talk, I try to speak s slower at a better pace and at a much moderate tone in order that everyone in the room feels what so they can be heard. And that's, that's part of that experience. So that's kind of that gender. Um, thing that I see a lot in the offices, and, I, and I, it bothers me a lot. The other thing I would say in reference to that is that uh, recently in class, you know, we have 90 students in our, in our sophomore class, and we actually were able to lay out every project down this incredibly long wall. And I would challenge anyone to tell me who's the gender identity of anyone in that. There's, there's no way you can tell. Who, if they're male or female or, or anything like that. It's, it's just, we have great students who can do amazing work and, uh, and everybody can do it. And uh, I think that that's something that I'm, I'm trying to emphasize where I am and uh, certainly increasingly I'm beginning to see as something we should really uh, pay attention to. Finally, I just want to say that my wife, I should say in, in all fairness, my wife is an architect. So, um, we have conversations about gender and architecture a lot, and, and you might find it interesting to know that she's always out, outranked me for the last 15 years, and she's been a vice president. So, you know, my role is, you know, we actually have a very supportive relationship as architects. Her, her, her primary uh, focus has been an uber super manager and, and project manager, and she's outstanding at doing that. And my role has been more on design and sort of, but we've been extremely complementary to each other, and we found that extraordinarily powerful for both our professional life and also for our marriage. Thank you. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming. I just want to thank Leora for the invitation to come and Ken for doing it. <laughs> a wonderful job of keeping us moving. Um, and so, Michaela, really um, great question. Uh, and it sort of is, you know, made, kind of makes me think about um, kind of how I got to where I was. And, I, you know, I would just say there was no roadmap. This was not planned. I never would have imagined myself certainly as an academic, certainly as somebody who has a doctoral degree, uh, and it was just not, but the way I got here was I just, I, I just kept asking questions, because I would see things that, well, that doesn't make sense, why is that that way, you know, and, and, and so the fact that I wasn't getting the answers made me realize, well, I need, I need to find, I need to figure out what are the questions to pose, but also um, generate the answers myself, and, and that's been a really big critical project. And I would just say along the way, I was really fortunate. I was, um, I also went to the University of Virginia um, in Charlottesville, and um, our class was the first class that was 50% women. And I can say that was way before you started UVA. This is, uh, I will tell you, it's the class of 81. So, so this was really when, you know, having a class that is half women was pretty groundbreaking at that moment. 
But it wasn't just that we were half women, because I think what, what I learned the most from my undergraduate experience in architecture was that we weren't just a class of women. Um, it was really the intersectionality, right? Um, classmates of color, I had queer classmates, I had disabled classmates, and we couldn't factionalize in studio the way you can in a university. We had to spend a lot of time together helping each other, learning about each other, you know, and I think that gave me, that, that really opened me up to possibility and to what, what creativity really asks of you, which is, is to be open and not fear that, that you do not know, which is, I think, kind of an ethical question, fundamentally. And so I've always kind of been interested in the kinds of intersectionality. I was also very lucky that my professor, my second semester, was a woman named Lucia Finney. Um, and so um, she was just an amazing kind of role model for me to see a really kind of smart, sophisticated, engaged um, woman, um, professor, um, who recognized that I had a kind of hidden intellectual capacity that I think some of my male professors were squashing to the point where I got so frustrated. I, left, I went to the AA for a semester because I was so frustrated that my, my I think my intellectual capacity was not being stimulated by the education that I was getting. And that was one of those just, you know, huge risky moves, again, like, this is not working for me, let me go somewhere else. Um, and it was remarkable, and again, it was a really huge intellectual awakening with an incredibly diverse group of people who are now kind of cosmopolitan and international. Um, at that moment, and so I've been very fortunate, even in my grad class, to have an amazing group of diverse colleagues, again, coming from all kinds of subject positions, and that's, that's really enriched it. Which isn't to say I have not had roadblocks. I'll never forget my first evaluation in my first job uh, for, for a big architectural engineering firm, and I was getting evaluated, and I was told I lacked ambition, you know? <laughs> and that was to put me in my place. Um, and I've never looked back, and I guess that person is still where they are. <laughs> um, you know, and when I wanted to go to graduate school, I wanted to do, a, you know, a, you know, a PhD. I was an unlikely, unlikely academic. I became an academic because there was no jobs, and I finished my my, my master's, my mark in '91. So most of my class is actually academics. And so I ended up teaching, and I met a really great group of geographers who kind of said, you should do a doctoral degree. So I wanted to work on race and architecture. But that topic was threatening, I think, um, to academia at the time. Um, and I didn't have the right pedigree, I don't think. I, the topic made people uncomfortable, but I, I found another space. I found American Studies where I did my doctorate. Um, so that's to say, you know, even if you find those roadblocks, remember there's a kind of capaciousness for where you could potentially move, allies that you can potentially find. And that, for me, has kind of kept me moving and kept me in dialogue, I think, and kept the thinking really fresh. Um, and, and um, you know, and so that's how I would kind of describe how I got here. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you again to everyone uh, involved in organizing, and thank you, Michaela, for the question. Um, I was trying to think how best to answer this, but I, I didn't intend to be someone who was interrogating gender inequalities necessarily, and so it's exciting to, that this panel is even happening, that this discussion is happening. So, um, I and what I guess you would consider an elder millennial. Um, and one of the things that comes with this was being someone who grew up in the 80s was that the generation of women that I'm part of were often told that all of this was kind of sorted out, like that we didn't need to worry about gender inequality because you know we had Title IX and we could play basketball and soccer and softball and we could go to class and get A's and we could kind of do whatever we wanted. Um, and I think I really internalized that as something to be like, this isn't something I need to invest a lot of time and energy in because it's solved. Um, and it wasn't necessarily, I, I came across an article that introduced me to the term late-breaking feminism. <laughs> and I think that that might be something, I think there was a lot of resistance. Um, I graduated from high school in 2000, a lot of resistance from those of um, 
that were in my classes at that time. I also went to the University of Virginia. We kind of didn't want to talk about it. We wanted to say, like, it's, it, we're just architects. We're architects first, and gender identity doesn't necessarily need to be discussed. And a couple of things happened. I think the petition um, for the Pritzker Prize that went out for, um, I might like Denise Scott Brown, I'm sorry. It's hard to, bad to tell the story and then forget the punchline. Um, came out, and then my beginning of my tenure track position coincided with the 2015 election cycle when um, Hillary Clinton was uh, being sort of torn apart in the media. And regardless of how you feel about her politics, I think the gendered nature of the language that came out of that, as I was someone moving into a position of authority in my career, I think I was somehow surprised by the level of misogyny present in the world. Um, and maybe I, it sort of, it made me ask a lot of questions as I started to develop the lab of what kind of culture might you make around technology because I think technology is often discussed as if there's a neutrality to it because you can be right or wrong, especially when you're coding. Um, and so around that time, I had Googled, or not Googled, I had queried um, feminism in the Kumikat database, which is a database of about 14,000 technology papers from journals and um, different journals and different conferences, and it only got one hit back. And this was in 2017. And so I think it, it kind of made visible to me that things that I think had been kind of be become less visible for all sorts of reasons needed to be revisited frequently. And um, that I had to really think about as an instructor how I could choose not to re-perform the things that happened in my education that were perhaps less welcoming um, in ways of making, trying to figure out, and I mean, these are a lot of aspirations, and I can't say that I've always been successful in them, but of trying to make sure that the loudest person isn't always the one that gets heard, or um, that your teams, they teach design and build, um, so how do you create a space where everyone um, feels that they can engage with tools of construction, because oftentimes, it, you know, men that don't form to notions of masculinity, don't feel comfortable, or women might actually know what they're doing, but they won't speak up, or, you know, the loudest person is running around with a chop saw, and you're like, um, <laughs> and so how do you kind of interrogate those power structures, and as someone who was now in sort of quote-unquote in charge, I couldn't be mad at anybody else, I had to be the person who, it's a lot easier to kind of like, be like, all the bosses are ruining it for us all. And then you're like, oh no, I... <laughs> um, so I think those are things about power. And I wanted to, I wanted to slip in one thing, I think, do I still have time? Yes, you have like A little time. Um, I thought a lot about power differential and the, these ideas of construction and the academy, and that if we say the academy is kind of where this all starts, how we work to repair those issues. But also that, and I just kind of, I found these questions hard to divide, so this is sort of goes to number three, too, is that when I, I go out and I have to talk to a lot of people in industry and a lot of people who sell things who are like experts in like gravel or like making beautiful kitchen cabinets. And they're almost always gentlemen, and they're almost always gentlemen of a certain age. And that's fine in the sense that like we actually find a lot of common ground around the notion of making things. We might not have anything else in common. But we can like talk about the craft of constructing and engaging with material. And I also can go into that and say, like, I don't know anything about this because I don't have to pretend that I'm an expert in everything ever related to construction because oftentimes people, you know, if I'm at Home Depot, they assume I don't know anything. And sometimes it kind of works to your advantage in the sense that um, I don't know if when we talk about masculinity or having to kind of pretend that you know something that I don't necessarily have that burden and that sometimes that can actually be quite liberating. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I must skip over the first two parts. There's not much for Curry to speak of, but um, <laughs> um, coming soon. Coming soon. But 
As far as like speaking from my perspective as a student, um, I actually found this question a little bit difficult to answer because I realized I was trying to pinpoint um, a certain example of where um, I felt like the effects of these power differentials um, because of maybe a non-professor or I was just outnumbered on a panel. It's five men as I present. Just situations like that, but I think in reality, um, it's hard to face things that are actually painfully obvious. Um, these like these power differentials aren't actually subtle, but it's something that we become accustomed to in our daily life. Um, I looking at my notes. Um, yeah, I think. I think that these issues of power differentials, um, an idea that came to mind was that it's actually a subconscious awareness. It's something that we learned when we were very young to be maybe more um, subordinate to like um, just our male leaders in our life, but um, now it's become a habit and it's actually subconscious. It affects um, our realities, how we interact with people. Um, and especially in a professional architecture where um, taste and craft and creativity can actually shine through, the things that are, I think, holding women back um, is having the confidence and sense of comfort to like allow their own power to come through. Um, I think that, um, yeah, as a student, as a woman, there's definitely another layer of stress um, that I know that my male counterparts never experience as far as um, having moments like this to speak of um, where I don't find this comfortable, but um, I think that that's where we can start to push back um, on these power differentials and actually, um, by being uncomfortable, I think is where um, we can gain power back. That's very eloquent. Um, we have seven minutes on this topic to respond to one another if we are interested in, in doing so. Um, I, uh, if anyone wanted to jump in, I also had some follow-up questions. Um, in terms of uh, Mabel, for example, um, in terms of um, how you had to navigate your own interests in in uh, academia on race and finding uh, a place for that in, in another department, perhaps adjacent to some architectural issues, how did you then um, find yourself back in architecture, uh, the academia of architecture? Like, how did you translate that experience and, and push for that to, you know, find the right place at the right time? Yeah, no, I, I, that's a really great question. I, I think in my case, it, it worked out really well <laughs> in the sense that I did not want to leave pra I practice. I was still invested in actually making things. Um, and I kept getting the sense that if I were going to become, do architectural history, I couldn't do that. And so by actually going into another discipline, I could actually stay in a weird way as a designer, which then became the way in which I yeah, started a practice as soon as I started my PhD. Um, so that, that somehow kept, kept me kind of tethered um, back, back to the discipline in, in, in certain ways. Um, so yeah, so I figured out a kind of way of, of maintaining you know, a certain kind of identity that I, that I wanted in the field. But I, I maybe want to get back to something that Kayla talked about, about the everydayness of the power differential. Um, and maybe we can start to think about um, you know, kind of how privilege works, which I, Damon, I appreciate that you said you have to lower your voice in, in a certain way. Because I think that is the thing of power, that it accords certain benefits and privileges and opportunities. Um, that move you further along or, or allow you to, to live in more comfort, right? Mm -hmm. And it's precisely the challenge of that comfort that makes us uncomfortable. And they, they could be in, in a myriad of ways, um, you know, that, that people sort of, occup, you know, are able to access, uh, access those benefits. But I think to be mindful, you know, of those who don't have those opportunities or those benefits or those comforts or, you know, is, is one way to then exactly lower your voice, be, be you know, be, 
be cognizant, right, of, you know, kind of where you are in relationship to others. And I think that's really important. Because I, the everyday is, is historical, and it's structural. It doesn't just happen, right? But it's produced by, and it's also institutionalized, which oftentimes seems like it's impossible to turn back. But I think it starts with exactly recognition, right, of those power relations. I think that that recognition is, um, is very challenging uh, in the sense that, that when you're dealing with, let's say, overt racism, you know what you're looking at, you know what you're dealing with, but with microaggressions and um, very subtle um, uh, challenges, I think it's so much more difficult because you're kind of fighting a ghost. Uh, you know it's there, but it's, there's nothing tangible to actually can't just punch that ghost. It's amorphous. <laughs> and I think that's really tricky because I was reading recently, um, I believe it's the ACFA that did a study about how when um, women uh, students are presenting their projects, um, they are interrupted something like 50% more times than a male, like during the presentation, than, than um, a male presenter, a male student presenter. So I thought, you know, that's so... I mean, who's counting? <laughs> We're not counting. But it's very difficult. So again, that's like this microaggression. And in some ways, it's so subtle, it's so masked. You hardly even notice it. Um, and I think that's very difficult to come at. Well, I think it, it especially in academia, it goes to a larger question of the behaviors we collectively have accepted from people, regardless if it's gendered or not, but just sort of the bad behavior that seems to perhaps need to be revisited in the academy. Um, because otherwise, it puts it on the individual person to receive whatever that activity was that happened towards them, somehow figure out how to document and then communicate it with someone. And you can feel like a little bit gaslit, like you're like, did I make it up? You know, like because it's so sometimes not even subtle, but just pervasive. And I think what's interesting is I have some really kind, thoughtful male colleagues who are attempting to like know what that means to be an ally, and they're pissed off all the time. But I'm like, guys, if we're pissed off about everything, we can't get anything done. I got to pick like one thing a day to be mad about. Um, and that's like the that's what's really fascinating is because when you do sort of reveal some of these things. To someone around you, they start seeing them, and then they're like, how is this happening? And like, it's just Tuesday, man. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> what's happening? And I think that's what's, that's what's tough, is that it can be, um, I think there's a sometimes a level of exhaustion that comes with it, if it's something where you feel like you have to explain it all the time, and then they are trying to maybe explain something systemic where the person in front of you might be kind, but they're also part of the problem, maybe? And how do you have that conversation in a productive way where they're going to listen to you? I, I have this fantasy that maybe that we could all like create a skit, yeah. like SNL, and that we would, in the skit, we would, we would actually play out all of these uh, certain microaggressions that we've experienced, right. and it would be so hilarious, um, but it would be so true, yeah. true and hilarious, um, and I think, like, I had this dream, because I feel like the, that, um, that comedy can really um, be incredibly sticky, and I think, you know, we get gazillion hits, so that's, that's the, you know, that would be really fun to do that. <laughs> Um, we have 45 seconds. Um, so, oh yeah. Well, I was just thinking back to that uh, one argument. I, I these two young people in my office, and they were both brilliant. One was from the University of Michigan, one was from the University of Toronto. And uh, they were arguing over the smallest thing, which was just the shadow on a drawing. And the question was, does a curved surface produce a curved shadow? <laughs> and they were going back and forth, you know. And but the problem was that I had to talk to the young man about it later was that, you know, he was at some point just wanted to win. Mm -hmm. And see that that was that's the problem. So I haven't mentioned gender yet. 
But really the issue was he turned an intellectual conversation, which is something we needed to have, and turn it into a win at all costs scenario, which caused him to, to keep raising his voice to the point where it was the intimidation. It wasn't really intellectual anymore. So that, to tell you the truth, was my first experience watching other people going, going through this. And as a leader, I realized that, and we'll talk about this later about intervention and things like that probably, uh, that I had to intervene in those kind of situations and help teach lessons about why that's not positive. Thank you so much. We're going to move to the next question. Thank you, Michaela. So um, next, uh, Sydney, if you can join us. Uh, the question is, must one af affect one's identity expression in order to integrate into the academy and or the profession? I think we started to address that already. Um, and how does progression in your career relate to how and to what degree you express your identity? So perhaps as you gain more seniority or um, you may express yourself um, more authentically perhaps? And what do you do when aspects of your identity feel like a barrier to entry or progression? Do you have to commodify or dilute your identity? Whoever wants to jump in. Well, I've, been, I've been waiting for this one. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, it's Michaela, right? You know, I just want to also say that, uh, you know, I work with students and, and I try to be an ally in this whole situation. And when someone has this a little bit of a drawback like you did, I would say, you, you know, I always go to them and I say, you know what, you're amazing. You know? And so I, I go out and I act and say, you know, I really, you're the smartest person I've ever met and I think you're going to really make a difference. You know, so just saying stuff like that, it's not like I'm making it up. You know, I really believe it. You know, I see your intelligent person, you're up, you're up here. You know, that makes a difference. So I want you to leave here. All right, so. Um, <laughs> Thanks to all the students. <laughs> You're all amazing. <laughs> all right. Let me, I need to ask a question, so, because I have like a whole page on this. <laughs> so, so, when you, could you help define what you mean by your face? Because um, when you read post colonial studies, there's, it defines, tries to define all kinds of things about. Uh, words like racism, essentialism, hegemony, all you know, they go into deep uh, definitions, but often as we find in these terms, they have multiple meanings, or they have subtlety meanings. So could you explain a little more, help us a little bit more, do you mean, um, are you speaking in terms of a reference group, and sort of like, I have to belong, I have to be like them in order to be a part of them, or are we talking about the pure notion of a facing, which is, shyness, which is, I must hide who I am to prevent being discriminated against. So maybe you can help clarify. Um, so Sydney is, uh, is one of the students who worked on these uh, questions. So these are actually, uh, the questions have been uh, worked on collectively, so all of the students have had uh, an equal part in them, and then they uh, were voted on together. Um, so. It's not just Sydney's question, but um, so uh, Sydney is free to respond to that. Um, um, the way I took it when we were uh, writing them all and we're shopping them was more of a, I guess, the latter of a shyness, but also of, um, I guess, more of like an acceptance to just go by without making too much of a ripple effect. That kind of okay, so I'll try to be brief. Um, so I definitely know what that feels like. Um, and it, ch it changed a little bit for me when, it kind of started when a lot of things, when I was about 13, I went to a magnet school. See, so that means it's academic magnet school. And so right, at, right as soon as that started, I became other because I wasn't like the rest of my neighbors anymore. I was going to, this is a quote from my life, the smarty pants school. <laughs> and, that, and that's what I was being characterized for. And I, I didn't like it. It was actually really kind of her fault, to tell you the truth. So yes, I, at that point, I had to try to downplay this, you know, and when we played ball or all these other things, or the Cub Scouts, 
I was, yeah, you know, I, yeah, my, yeah, you know, I had algebra in seventh grade, <laughs> you know, but, you know, so I had to kind of downplay that. But I think over time, uh, as I got older, I kind of got over over it a little bit, and um, I realized that I can't change the minds of other people. That was the first thing I had to realize. I also had to focus on in myself, knowing that I have to not worry about what other people think about me. I mean. It, there's no one can say they never do that, but I can't let it dominate my life or who I am, worried about what someone else thinks about me in, in, in some kind of shallow way, you know. So, um, uh, eventually, I was just want to turn it around. This has a very odd way of turning itself around because what happened was when I became a junior in college, I was still worried about that. But it was sort of high, I was hiding it, you know. And then one day, someone came up to me and said, "Hey, uh, I'm having trouble with this structural problem. Can you help me?" And I thought, "Me?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, after I helped that person, someone else came to me and said, "Hey, you know, I'm having trouble with this. Can you help me?" And it just changed my world from that. It made me realize that I don't need to hide anything. Anymore. They were, people need, needed me as much as I needed them. I just didn't look for it anymore. And so I say that, yeah, it was an incident, but those kind of things that happened to me in my life made a difference because I, it, it paved the way for me to deal with stuff going down the road. And, they were, and we're gonna talk about it all day because I'm sure we're all gonna have our stories. But they are all different situations. But uh, it helped me understand that there's a way to kind of combat it or to manage it, to inform other people, educate other people, um, and, and you know, to find a path that's positive. I mean, I think this is, I mean, you guys really came up with some great questions. I think uh, they're really challenging to answer, but it, um, I think that's probably why we're here. Um, I think one of the things I've discovered, and maybe this is sort of to pick up on, on some of the same reflections in a way, is that even if I wanted to efface my identity or was attempting to, that doesn't mean the people around me were. And you know, we all have our story, but one that really stuck out to me was that I have a colleague who both started tenure track at the same time. He's a gentleman. And we were at a conference, at an AIA conference, and I had just got my license, and I had my little name tag, and it said like my name, and it said the letters, and it was like, <laughs> I'm an architect. <laughs> and this gentleman's talking to us, and it's Iowa, so everyone's like painfully nice, at least publicly. Um, and he looks at Nick, my colleague, and he's like, well, you're a professor, and you teach all this computation, that's so great. And he looks at me and he goes, and what do you do? And I was like, oh. It like doesn't matter. Like I'm literally like wearing my resume on my name tag, and it's like, what? And why are you here? Um, and I think it goes back to that kind of notion of like not apologizing for who you are. Or, and I'm still working on this, by the way. I find myself saying sorry way more than I should. But of taking up space, of being present, um, and not apologizing for bringing up structural issues, of saying like this happened. And I'm not going to like you know. In I did not do anything thoughtful or clever or like say anything really smart at the time. But I think um, moving forward, when you're thinking about like how you might engage with different facing, whether it's happening in front of you or sort of more broadly, um, I also found that it was easier for me to be feisty and angry and to fight back on behalf of my students, that when it wasn't about me, I felt more empowered um, in ways that I think I, I wanted someone to like look at me and like guess what I was thinking and fight on my behalf. Um, and I mean, this is always a sort of ch the challenge of speaking on behalf of anybody, but things that are really blatant, like having like all male review panels like over and over and over again, or like having things that should be changed and have become sort of invisible to people, or maybe they just got tired and stopped counting. Um, so I don't know if that's totally answering the question, but I think that kind of idea that 
even when we do a face or sort of apologize, um, or maybe that there are so many other ways to kind of engage with that challenge, and also like the idea of watching someone else succeed because you couldn't be brave enough or engage in the way you wanted to, I think can be very motivating to say like, I'm gonna try harder next time to be heard, and that that can be very uncomfortable. Um, especially when you feel like a squeaky wheel, or like somehow it's like your personal problem rather than a larger structural issue, and then how to have an ask. Because I think it's very easy to be angry, and it's very hard to be like, and this is the thing I want to change, and to kind of like specify that in something actionable that isn't just sort of a blanket statement that things are frustrating or discriminatory. Um, and again, that it can sometimes be cloaked in otherwise sort of kind situations. So you're like, do I bring this up over coffee? <laughs> like, like, when's the right time to be righteously angry? And is that always, or is it, you know, do you have to set aside times to be angry in effective ways so it doesn't eat away at you? So I have a question about the idea of so this is a really tough, tough question. I had to think, you know, I, I think that we all go through at certain moments of, of facing, maybe even in adolescence, you know, you have to kind of shut things off. Um, I would say that more recently I've noticed that um, uh, the, the, the academy actually and the profession have really um, addressed a lot of issues, but the one place where I personally feel that I still must face um, certain aspects of my identity um, are really around family life. Um, in the academy and in the profession, um, it is still very difficult for, uh, I, I have a very full life. I have a practice, um, I'm, I'm a mother, I'm a wife to a wonderful husband, um, I teach, I have all these things, but the one thing I will never talk about is the fact that I am uh, a mother. Um, and I think that's strange. I ask myself, why is that? Why do I need it? Why is that the one thing? Well, a couple of reasons I realized, and this question prompted me to kind of uh, come to grips with. So I teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, also known as the Gay School of Design. So, you know, most of my colleagues don't have children, um, and most of my um, women colleagues uh, decided not to have children. I'm actually one of the few people who decided to have children. Um, I have a number of junior colleagues, uh, both men and women, who have very small children because they're at the start of their career, maybe they have toddlers. The city of Cambridge has a, a number of child care centers. They all close at 5 o'clock. And if you show up one minute after 5 p.m., you get charged $50 for every minute that you wait, or whatever it is, some exorbitant rate. Now, studio ends at 6, 6 p.m. So if you're lucky to get out of studio on time, you're usually running late anyway. Uh, who's doing the pickup? Now, if you have a spouse or a significant other or a, a, a babysitter who wants to work one hour, uh, maybe, and you have to pay that a person $100 an hour or more, uh, maybe you can make that work. But it is structurally deeply problematic because whoever, you know, if you have a family life, you're pretty, you're screwed. Am I getting too? I'm behind Leora, so actually nobody. <laughs> so I, I do think that you know the logistics matter so much in the question of, of, of so this is a really big question: how are you facing your identity? Um, and here's this incredibly my like this minutia. Malcolm Gladwell realizes that it's all in those little details of the logistics that matter so much and. You know, down the street at MIT, um, Mi Jin Yoon, who was chair um, in the architecture department, said, you know what? Let's just shift the studios. We're going to end at five so everybody can go pick up their kids. Boom, it was done. But like a place that's like, like the Titanic, the GSD, it's never going to get done. <laughs> I've been asking for seven years, it's not getting done. Um, so I realize it's not an environment where you can actually reveal the truth of your condition. And I, my heart aches when I see those junior faculty running out, like freaking out. I have older kids now, so I'm not in that moment. Um, when I was 
in the earlier stages of my academic career at the University of Wisconsin, the child care center was across the street. We happened to close at five. And I often think to myself, what if it hadn't been like that? What if I had, hadn't been at a school like that? That just happened to have those small logistical things that now I realize were life-changing. The fact that, and that there was a lactation room. Wow. You know, like that, those were life-changing. And simply, you know, that, so that's the one thing that I find now as a, um, a senior faculty in a very revered institution that I can never talk about that. And, you know, I realize that for my kids who are now at college, you know, they're in high school, they're getting older now, I look at them and I say, you know, oh, you know what am I asking you to face? I mean, this question prompted a lot of you thinking. And I realized that, you know, we, uh, they're on the precipice of their college apps, or they're thinking about that now. And I said, you know what? You're half Asian, but on those college apps, you're a white boy. Because right now, you know, because right now, you know, if you're Asian, you gotta score that, you know, 10% higher, like you're not gonna be Asian. You're not, you know, Harvard just went through big legal, you know, battle about that. So you're not Asian. And I thought to myself, oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I realized that because we're in this incredibly, you know, crazy environment, I'm asking him to face 50% of his identity. He's half Korean. But I don't want anybody to know that. Not all those college apps. Isn't that terrible? How could how, that? How, so, you know, it's amazing what we have suppressed in, um, uh, in order to um, appear certain ways. And that appearance is actually so critical that, wow, blow me away. Yeah, no, I, I would only add, um, really, I think what, what Grace is saying is that, you know, there are these kind of perceptual norms, right? That, and that we don't recognize that not everybody's going to fill that fill that category, um, and it becomes oppressive in, 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 you know, in, in the ways in which we don't see the complexities and the nuances, right, of, you know, that people are living very, very different lives, whether, you know, they're, you know, and, and again, it's not, I know this is a conversation about gender, but you cannot take out class, you cannot take out race, you cannot take out sex. I mean, they all intersect in very complex ways that then, you know, we may think we're all in the room and we're all the same, but as you say, we're having actually vastly different experiences um, in the world. Um, and like I often get, oh wow, you know, you're, you're a full professor at Columbia, it must be, you know, like you're at the top of your game. And, you know, I had, <laughs> I was co-teaching a studio, um, the former student of mine who is a white, straight male, um, and we did, you know, we did a studio presentation we were dealing very head-on with questions of racial division. And he was really surprised, given the prompt, the prompt is associated with a major exhibition that's going to be opening in the fall, um, you know, he thought, well, we would have more students. And I said, Jordan, one, it's about race, people don't want to deal with it. And two, I'm a black woman, and most people aren't going to necessarily listen to what I'm saying, because they won't know me, they don't know who I am. They just see me presenting a studio. Well, what does she have to offer, right? And so there's that kind of initial judgment, right, that often um, can shut you down regardless of who you are or regardless of, of, of what you want to project. And that was verified at the end of the studio because one of my students, very well meaning, you know, said this is an extraordinary studio. I mean, it's phenomenal. But it was so underrated compared to all of the other studios. Um, and you know, and that was just very, very, very telling. Even though I am speaking, you know, about what we're doing, I'm still being read in very, very particular ways. And that, you know, that can be challenging because, you know, we're very, very complex individuals with history. And I think it's, a, it's important to recognize that. And sometimes you cannot, you know, it's, it's just really hard in terms of, you know, how you're being judged. And one of the ways that I, I work through is I, I actually do have just different communities, even on campus. I mean, they're. You know, the reading groups that I have that are predominantly women, where, you know, we're talking, I had a really great group in Gender in the Archive, where we were dealing with issues around gender and archival work. You know, I teach um, in another you know, department that's dealing with, you know, African-American and African diasporic cultures. That's a whole other, and then I have my architecture community. Um, you know, and that's what I mean, we are in, in many ways multifaceted in that regard. Um, but it's still, I think, on an individual, level, it does become very challenging, and I think it's important to, and I don't want to say oh, all the self-care stuff, but, but I do think that we have to find, and we have to recognize, you know, and sometimes, yeah, it's good to get angry, 
sometimes we cannot spend the entire time just fighting because that's going to wear us out. And so trying to figure out like where are we going to put the energy um, into sometimes trying to make changes, can't change everything. Um, when should we get angry? And when we have to kind of just take care of our own uh, mental well-being, which is also related to our physical well-being. Go, go ahead. Um, so looking into all of these, I am coming from only like being an academic background. I am in my first year of graduate school directly out of undergrad. And a lot of what I've had to do within academics is for, um, perhaps maybe like research interest or anything like that. I've always been very wary of doing something that might be pushing the envelope in my field of like preservation of would like say the university be approving what I'm doing right now. Um, and I guess a, a lot of the facing comes from the fact that when I get into an entry level position, I'm not. I don't want to stand out, I don't want to create havoc or anything like that, just because obviously it's an entry level, you can have more risk, but um, yeah, and I guess a lot of this is permeated um, through experiences, not like specific, there have been specific instances, but a lot of it is subconscious, like Nikila mentioned, about just doing things, like inherently in your everyday actions, like you're like, hmm, should I be doing this, and consciously working against it a lot of times, so um, I guess um, when I get in one particular instance, I often belittle myself a lot in order not to like create too much um, chaos, I guess, or um, out of like a fear of like imposter syndrome, and at an internship with a state agency this past summer, I actually, um, there was a building manager who had shared the same building and office as me, and the entire time he thought I was a secretary, even though I was the intern and was there every single day, but recognized the other male intern who, who was in his 30s and thought he was a full time staff, actually. And then I was like, uh, we're in the same position. <laughs> so I guess it's just little instances that, like that that kind of forces. Um, I guess like people in my position to like kind of like stand our ground and like check the climate and I guess pursue um, fields and areas and environments that are comfortable. So say um, there is a poster uh, symposium that I'm trying to participate in and I'm doing research on queer country bars and I'm trying to represent it at Texas A&M. So um, strangely enough, um, my funding for research got sponsored for another project rather than this one, and I am going out of my own free will to a and <laughs> to present this, even though I didn't get funded, just because I am, I find a need to present this kind of research, because obviously, yeah. Um, so even if it is uncomfortable, even if it's not like a conversation that should, a lot of people don't want to be talking about, I guess that comes to mind, and, um, I really liked um, that one of you all had mentioned that the notion of like we were just architects had, um, because I realized like a lot of things are nothing is necessarily neutral and in preservation especially because it's so politically charged sometimes you kind of have to stand your ground. Thanks. I wanted to add that um, they actually asked you to change the title of your. Um, your presentation. Oh. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, you don't have to. Yeah. But um, <laughs> this is another example of like, academia. <laughs> you know, academia um, trying to uh, smooth things over, um, yeah. sort of like euphemize some of the topics you were trying to, you want, you are discussing, but in terms of the title. Yeah. Um, um, in terms of, um, uh, I think a lot of I, th I think a lot of the comments here had to do with, um, in, in part, presumptions others are making um, at face value about um, who you are, uh, your expertise, um, and um, I just I think that it's it's interesting to reflect in, on uh, uh, harkening back to Denise Scott Brown's experience um, that Shelby brought up. Um, over not receiving a Pritzker with um, her partner, uh, Robert Venturi, 
Um, it's interesting, I was just looking at um, uh, a piece she wrote in the 70s called Room at the Top, which I think you would all be interested in. And she's speaking around her experiences with essentially misogyny um, in architecture as an academic and as a professional. And she, she talks about this all the time, um, where um, when she's meeting with clients, with Robert, um, the client will say, oh, here's the architect to Robert, and then they'll turn to Denise and say, well, what do you do? Oh, you're the wife? So I just thought, to give some historical context, this, this has been going on for a long time, and it persists. So obviously it's persisting. But I think that's one of the things is like, the I want to make a comment on what your, your research real quick, but just the way we ask questions even, like I have been asked even now, if I'm a student, which I'll take as a, you know, I'm aging well. <laughs> but I'll take it as a compliment in a way, but it's really more like about assumptions. Yeah. And so I told myself, how do I never do this to another young woman in the academy? How do I not replicate this? And it was like, I always say like, oh, what do you do here? Like, tell me about what you do here. Not like guessing what someone does. And it's like those small changes can be super impactful when you can take something that happened to you and at least like model for somebody. I'm not the terrific But I wanted to say about effacing, like one of the things you're mentioning about presenting something in a really complicated context is as a teacher, one of the things, you know, Somehow, I mean, I think we all are like in our own heads, so sometimes you forget that if I'm a facing, everyone else around me might be too, in a way that might not be visible to me, and their facing could be class-based, or it could be about a home life or an illness, or just all the things that humans deal with by being a human. And that one of the things that I hadn't thought about was when I did bring things up, or if you, for example, are presenting about gay bars, you can't look at your audience and know who that's speaking to. And I think as a teacher, I had to start to be like, I'm like, I can't guess what somebody's life or positions or questions they're asking themselves are. And that somehow even just having that conversation sometimes can speak to someone in the audience who's struggling in a way that you would have no way of knowing because they don't even know how to articulate it to you, nor will they. So that you still, you go and do it anyway. I think it's my point, is because you don't know who's out there. Who's, maybe no one's even said, like, told them a gay bar is a thing. You don't know where the conversation is for that person. So it's, you know, it's and yeah, and oh, the other one's workarounds. You brought up Mija Mean, and she wrote this great piece in a, um, Architect Magazine as an opinion about workarounds, about the idea that women and people throughout the academy who haven't necessarily been recognized have invented all these clever ways to kind of like sneak stuff in. So sometimes I'll be talking about technology and then I'll just sneak in side of feminism. Like, <laughs> we all thought you were going to hear about like robots, but I'm going to talk to you about this whole other thing. You know, so like sometimes like sort of playing the academy's own game, like being like very totally normalized title. Slash, guess what we're going to talk about? <laughs> um, we still have four minutes on this topic if anyone else wanted to. Well, I'm going to try this small exercise. <laughs> uh, just to kind of give you an idea about how deep effacing is and how it's evolved over time. Because when I was younger, um, well, recently in 2009, I actually went to Michael Jackson's funeral, which by chance, I don't know how it happened, but I actually ended up going. So that's kind of the culture I grew up in, because he's about the same age I am. So I like that music. So of all the people in the room, some of you actually have those iPod things that fit in your ear. But fortunately, no one's wearing one. <laughs> you know. uh, how many people have headphones when they listen to music? See, the thing about it is, when I was younger, everyone sort of knew the music you listened to. Because we had, I'm sorry, boom boxes. So it's sort of, you would, you're sharing, you were always sharing it with someone. And it became pretty 
evident where you were where you were thinking or something, you know, because your music said something about you. But now, see, everyone listens to their music like you have no idea what that person next to you, what kind of music they like. You have no idea. Is that a facing? But essentially, that's the world we live in right now. Unless, unless somehow you can, hey, you want to listen to this, and you know, you really don't know where everybody is on certain issues. And part of the technology is changing that as well. Um, it's interesting you bring up, like, uh, you know, um, uh, sonic space and the way that uh, you control sonic space and. Uh, it seems to harken back to your experience around your voice as well, like uh, maybe on the opposite end of, of of how we sort of like make ourselves present in a in a room and are and are perceived in a certain way, and then um, have to modulate aspects of how we express ourselves. Um, and in terms of like your voice, like I actually wanted to ask about that. Um, do you? In terms of like whispering or, or keeping your voice down, is how did that begin for you? And like, where was it out of a, a negative experience where someone t reacted negatively towards your 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 deep voice? Actually, I'm glad you asked that question. I wasn't going to bring that up, but um, it's actually not not of the above in that sense. So since we're we're being totally open about our experiences because, like I said, these questions are so deep, you know, there's no way to answer them unless you, you reach inside yourself and then pull it out. So, uh, obviously I came from an environment where speech was, it was, it had its own sort of um, accent, or is that the way to describe it, or its own, mm -hmm. uh, Cadence, I would say it has some cadence style, inflection, and so forth. And this allowed me to be able to communicate with a broad number of people in my community. And that's just what it was. And, and I didn't have a problem with that. But again, when I arrived at the school where there's 4,000 people who weren't like me, um, I have to tell you, I mean, I was. It was more than, uh, the effacing it came from something that was more than just being a little nervous about that. I mean, people were openly criticizing me for it, openly. And I have to tell you, that really hurt a lot. So in about three years, <laughs> I had to make that all disappear, basically. And, uh, and, and, and my, my uh, friend who's now, and a really good friend of mine who's in, in banking, um, him and I joke about it now after, after 40 years out of high school, and, we, and I talk to him on the phone when he's at work, and he has to un unravel a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I feel like you're not talking to one of your clients, you're talking to me now. And, and we joke about it now. Mm -hmm. um, but but the reality it's a real reality. So I had to change a lot of. I had to hide that. I had to kind of basically I had to change the the way I sound. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. We're going to move on to the next question because um, we just about ran out of time. Thank you, Sydney. Um, so, we will be joined by Aaron. So the question is, what does it mean to be gendered in the design professions? Is architecture an inherently masculine profession? Do we need to be masculine to succeed in the profession? And can uh, those who identify as men succeed without playing into the tropes of masculinity in architecture? <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll take on the second uh, part about um, the profession of masculinity. Um, 
you know, I think part, part of the work that I've been doing on, on race has required um, to, to really rethink the category of architecture. And, I, and I, I, the way I like to think about it is, um, and I say this often to students, is that architecture is the Western, it's the art of building. And it's a, it's a Western practice of how one builds. People build all over the world in many different ways, through many different protocols, through many different bodies of knowledge, through ways of being in the world. Architecture has a very specific historical trajectory. The trick that architecture did was to create a history of those roles of BA and then universalize the term architecture to then blanket all of these other ways. Um, and so I, I would just say that the discipline of architecture emerging um, from the Western body of knowledge, the Western episteme, which is actually very patriarchal, <laughs> privileges man, capital M-A-N, um, over ways of being human, um, that, 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 that actually does produce a discourse, right? That, does, it, that is very male-centered, that is very masculinity, that is very heteropatriarchal as is the Western canon, I mean the Western episteme, right? And, and architecture fits in with that formation. So, I mean, I would just argue, yeah, it's kind of always already a problem, right, in terms of the, the identity. It's, it's, it's racialized, it's, you know, that, that, is, that is part and parcel of that practice. So I would just say that we kind of have to maybe think about how we build, who we are building, um, I, I think we have to unpack a lot in order to, to win it. But, but I think it's part and parcel you know, of, the, of the rise of the discourse of, of architecture. Um, but I would also um, say that as that discourse became a profession in the 19th century, again, I mean, there was a certain kind of male who could become that. And, and the curriculums and the institutions formed around those identities. And we've been chipping it, trying to chip away at it, you know, um, from today. And yeah, you know, it, it has a historical uh, formation. So yeah, and, and I would just, it was just to say, it's not natural. It's very much constructed. Yeah. Um, and uh, Diana Grust actually uh, wrote about this uh, in 1988 in terms of the, the inherent masculinity around our conception of beauty and architecture um, in her essay, Architecture from Without, which traces how um, the 10 books of architecture, Vitruvius and the Renaissance um, thinkers uh, all created different conceptions of beauty derived directly from uh, an idealized white male body, um, and so uh, totally agree. <coughs> this is this is a, again a really good question, and you guys have done a really nice job workshopping these. I think a lot of what I find what makes people sort of cringe when you start talking about feminism sometimes is this idea that it's somehow anti-masculine or anti-men. Um, and that this idea of like, only women are gendered then, it's like the men are the like status quo and then you have this sort of deficit mindset of like, oh, you need to be closer to the status quo, or this could be race, class, like you could um, sort of spiral this out into larger questions. And it makes me think a lot about the idea of leaning in um, and the lean in sort of movement of that in many ways sort of says like if you behave more in masculine ways you will sort of be the in charge of your own success um, and I read something recently and then I think it was the New York Times that was criticizing this idea because I was like eh, if I don't lean <coughs> in any further I'm going to be laying down <laughs> um, but then but also <laughs> like <laughs> But also then, things like that we maybe, again, in the academy have let behaviors we've accepted that you don't necessarily want to replicate to be successful. Like, I don't want to talk over people and interrupt and make them feel bad, if that's like what it takes. 
Um, and so I think that that's something to think about, of like why do we value those traits and should we continue valuing some of them? And I'm sure you can all think of some of them, I won't belabor the point. Um, and then the other is this idea of masculinity and some of the, when I'm trying to be really empathetic, and those are definitely good days, and I think what would make somebody behave in the way that they are? Why would someone feel the need to say the things that they're saying? I try to reach deep for some empathy and think as a culture, what have we done to construct masculinity in a way that someone would think that's okay? Um, how have we told the men in our lives that behaving in that way is a pathway to success or um, a way to be seen as powerful or any number of other things? And I think, what would it feel like if someone said you're only allowed to have three feelings or like to only behave in a very narrow construct where as a woman if you're a tomboy you might be rewarded for that behavior and so that's my really when I'm feeling really empathetic what my uh, I go to oh, gosh <laughs> that's not every day I promise <laughs> there's some really unempathetic days <laughs> about um, uh, when, it's, when it seems that we're discussing, when we're talking about uh, a, a, a gender situation, we often automatically mean that that defines that there's something, uh, there's, there's somebody in a subordinate role. So it seems to equate with this idea that the minute it's female, it's actually secondary or it's in the, it's in the, it's in the um, again, subordinate position. Um, so I was just thinking about like, how do we how can we cope with that, or why is it that we do that? It seems that, you know, we were talking earlier about the question of um, defining, uh, Mabel brought up the, the whole Western canon, codifying what we understand to be architecture, and that's actually from a male Western perspective, and it's built like that. And I was thinking, well, so, that's, so it's no wonder that we would call um, a male a designer an architect um, and you might refer to that architect doing great work, but when you refer to a woman who is an architect, you need to use a modifier and say, she's, she, that's an exceptional woman. What an outstanding woman architect. So you can't just be the, an architect. <laughs> so you have to kind of identify as an exceptional, outstanding woman architect, because actually if you're just a woman architect, you, know, you kind of suck. So like, <laughs> you, you must be like this average thing, so that you know if you're actually of any relatively important, that's because you're, you're an outstanding woman architect. The rest of them, you know. Uh, yeah. So I think that's, we have to think about the ways that we create these strange modifiers, the necessity for a modifier when you refer to um, women in the field, at least I can say. Um, and, I, and I think it also goes back again to um, you know, how, how to cope with this. Maybe. I do think it's really so important to have mentors. And I, I didn't mean to suggest in, in the very first question that I had no male mentors. I had a lot of male mentors, I should say. But I think being an advisor is very different than being a mentor. Um, and that's, I, I think that's such an important thing that we need to um, do if we want to see some actual change. And um, if, we're, if we're not to understand uh, gendered conditions as always being um, secondary or subordinate, then you, we have to actually actively, very actively think through and why that is. And it has everything to do with these other subtle things like like um, um, strange modifiers that come with women architect, etc. We should start just saying male architect. There's a shirt that says male architect. You know, kind of like you just throw it in on your... Yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I think it's true. I actually wrote something recently around around race and I use white constantly and the editor said I don't think I've ever read anything that right where where that's just actively called out because it's just assumed when you're and it was about architecture you just assumed that you know that everyone else had to be identified with some kind of modifier so yeah I like that <laughs> we should all have to call uh, qualify our identities <laughs> if yeah. if some of us have to then we all have to or, yeah. Um, uh, Damon? Yeah, so, 
the male on this panel, something I was wondering if that would be for me. So I had to talk to my wife a lot before. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know about the, the, you know, I sort of wanted to find masculinity at the University of Arizona in our equity, diversity, and inclusion department for the whole university, which is a very extensive and, and um, amazing program, and lots of people that work in that environment. They actually have a specific unit on masculinity. And uh, I can't say that much more about it, but it's, 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 it's just for males, and it's really talking about some of the things we're talking about, how you use masculinity and how it can affect people. Um, but I also, I, when I was thinking about this, I was also thinking about masculinity and ego. And sometimes it's really, the ego is, is people who, have, who use ego as, as a device or something to kind of take control of situations or to, to, to dominate, or as I already said earlier, to win at all costs. It seems to be the real problem in a lot of cases is it's really um, that. But I just wanted to say that um, as a counter to that, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite books is um, Steve Jobs. And um, um, it's written about seven years ago. And um, in his dealings with the other tech giant, you know who that, that person is. That person, the other person, or we'll call him the, the protagonist, and Steve maybe is the antagonist, the protagonist doesn't have that ego, even though they're both males. So his approach, uh, which I want to talk about later in the tool set question later on, is that um, even though they got into some heated arguments that basically probably felt he could never win, he used um, the power of language to counter that in a way that's really subtle. So he used, sometimes we refer to that as zingers. So he could sort of zing his way into this sort of calm realm with amazing uh, response and, and ideas that were, that could not be disputed and, and he never had to raise his voice doing that. He didn't have to overpower the other person. He didn't have to show his muscles or beat his chest. Or anything. It, it actually is so powerful a thing that when I read it, I just felt like that's, I need to be like that. <laughs> because then my moments didn't have to, they could be somewhere else. You know, they didn't have to be at this level where it was more like a power thing. It was more about information and communication and, and knowledge and delivery rather than So, obviously as a white male, this question is really hard to me. Um, I, hearing all these responses has been really enlightening. Um, I had to think, I'm not super great, also just coming up with great things to say on the spot, so I wrote what I was going to say. Um, so I'll just start. Um, I wrote, to me, being gendered means recognizing differences of deep personal identity, um, which in itself is a a really good thing. Um, the evil of this comes when one manipulates his personal identity for the benefit of themselves or another. Um, and the way I saw this uh, presenting itself, I haven't had a ton of work experience. Most of it's been an internship that I had this summer, um, and also just in academia. Um, but the way I saw it present itself, um, just based off of my limited experience, was through tokenism. Um, and tokenism, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> is the practice of making only a perfunctory or symbolic effort to be inclusive to members of minority groups, especially by recruiting small numbers of people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of racial or sexual equality within a workforce. Um, and the thing about, I observed this happening not only in the design field, like this happens definitely not related to design. Um, 
And we could, I, I, I'm glad that we have talked about examples of how this has happened, how we've seen it happen in <coughs> academia and in work. Um, but I, I guess my, what I kept drawing from it was when you design with tokenism, your solutions represent a predetermined solution um, that largely serves one group of people, um, generally the people of the majority. Um, and no effort is actively being made to listen to other people's opinion. Um, and whenever I question, I, growing up in the Midwest, <coughs> a predominantly Christian family, like I have never had a super strong voice. I have a hard time standing up for injustice. Um, but I feel like something I've learned just through doing and observing so many, a lot of injustices is just being a good listener. And a lot of times, you know, that story of, of someone assuming you're a receptionist, like seeing that and using your, how people perceive me as a white male to the benefit of like, no, this is messed up. Like we really need to be talking about this. And I, while this didn't happen directly at um, the internship I was at, there was, there was a lot of times where we have design reviews and situations would come up where our female project lead would be, would be um, it, I feel like steamrolled over to other le uh, project leaders and it would just kind of get blasted past and we wouldn't even address it. Um, sometimes for practical reasons because like time was short, but I, I feel like if you're not listening for those things, if you're not an insider um, and you're aware of it, they, to me the challenge is being a good active listener um, and being it, when you have the opportunity of speaking up, which is incredibly hard for me, um, but it's even harder for y'all. So as I've heard, it, thank you guys so much for your response. Well, I'll give you some credit. You are in front of all of these people um, <laughs> talking about these things that do make us all uncomfortable in some different ways. Um, I, I wanted to kind of um, build off of uh, what, what Mabel started with um, in terms of uh, how masculinity is inherently uh, part of the, of, of the curriculum in, our, in, in Western architectural education and, uh, and abroad because a lot of uh, international uh, schools of architecture also refer a lot to Western canon. Um, but besides just the, um, the subject matter uh, that we are teaching, I think, it, I think we, we could maybe have a conversation just a little bit about like the structure of how we teach um, because, and, and the, the types of um, expectations uh, we have for students to perform in different ways. Um, and I think the ways that we may expect students to perform um, is modeled after, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, taking on a very egotistical, um, perhaps sort of more aggressive, and you might say masculine sort of identity in order to succeed and be heard um, in school, in, in the studio environment, um, when you're presenting um, your work in front of a group of critics, um, these different uh, sort of scenarios. Um, so I just thought maybe we could talk about the actual structuring of, of, of the education itself, besides just the content. How long do we have? We have 10 minutes. <laughs> just to say no, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I'll give an example, I think. I mean, I went to the GSD in 2008. Um, Scott Cohen was chair. There was a lot of parametric work going on. And I was in my first studio as a guy in advanced placements. I went to UVA, so I skipped the first year. So, you know, you're supposed to be like really good when you get advanced placement. And someone, you know, they open up Rhino. I've never seen Rhino. <laughs> I now teach technology. And someone goes, You don't know Grasshopper? <laughs> and Grasshopper was released in 2007. It wasn't like, you know, this thing that had been around for 30 years. And I think part of one of the things I wish and I hope in my teaching I do is just like, knock that. It's like, it may be the opposite of a facing is fronting. 
where you have to constantly pretend like you know everything, which keeps people from asking questions. And because asking questions is somehow a sign of weakness. So at least when I do these things, you know, people are like, oh, they're like, oh, I'm not good at Grasshopper. I'm not good at CNC. And I'm like, well, how much have you done? And they're like, oh, you know, like, I opened the file once. And I'm like, well, it's probably why you're bad, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not like a personal failing. Um, and that we remember that education collectively is ideally about finding out and learning things you didn't know before. It isn't supposed to be reciting what you already knew. And maybe that's, you know, these are the things that are quite powerful when you start to realize that, you know, architecture was built on continents other than Europe and in North America, and that there's this whole world out there. But if you're not allowed to ask those questions, it's very hard to even start some of those conversations. Or you don't feel like you can because you don't want to like look stupid or, you know, you don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I look it, exactly to that point about how you ask questions. We, you know, we had the classic architectural survey. Um, and about four years ago, um, we took the large survey and we actually split it up into three sections. So it's less a survey and more a seminar precisely so that people could ask questions. Uh, and then we took, um, you know, we, we took what, this, what the, the survey, and we didn't necessarily like globalize it and try to be this kind of all-inclusive and we're going to cover the globe. But what we did was we situated that canon, that Western canon, and tried to show how the formation of that body of knowledge of architectural history is actually productive through a European imperial project of colonialism. <laughs> and so we read primary texts, but we're, you know, and, but we're also trying to understand, like, this is how this world of architecture comes into being, through ideas of nationalism, and race, and gender, and labor, and, and all these things, and open it up as a dialogue that, in a way, kind of um, repositions, let's say, the authorial voice of the professor in that, in that way. Um, and so and it's actually been very interesting, and it's still an ongoing project, um, you know, in terms of exactly how we you know, try to decenter the canon more. Um, but it, I think it's been, it's been a very interesting um, pedagogical and curricular experiment. The other thing I just wanted to say, maybe around patriarchy and feminism, I've had situations where I've had white males be way more feminist than women of color who have operated as patriarchs. So, so it, it can be the kind of subject position you take within an institution and how you wield power. Right. And, and, and I think that's important to realize, that it's not something that's specifically naturalized, but, but it's how you engage power. Someone who writes super clearly on this is Roxane Gay. Her book, um, Bad Feminist, I felt like gave permission one to be a bad feminist to like, you know, she talks about liking Britney Spears and being a feminist and being like, I know that's weird. But these ideas that you can both be oppressing and be um, oppressed simultaneously and how you sort of try to engage with those questions. And I also think um, recently we've been having conversations at our school about how to uh, encourage students to see the jury process as um, um, one of inquiry and deep conversation. And, and a suggestion was made that Perhaps what we should do is make sure that the student who is presenting actually presents from a seated position, because that will make them feel more a part of the conversation, etc. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a good idea. That sounds kind of interesting. But then I realized that, that actually that also has a, an underbelly of a gendered scenario, because it assumes that the male who's sitting up there very awkwardly presenting something needs to kind of sit down and be one with the, with the jurors. Um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, as a very small Asian woman, I really appreciate the opportunity to stand, and I feel I feel very, very um, empowered by standing. And so I thought, you know, there's nothing wrong with standing. And, I, and then I, I realized, well, the actual issue has to be that we have to be more flexible to allow students to choose the format um, to inaugurate their own thinking about the way in which they might be able to um, create the right dialogue and atmosphere. Uh, because again, if, 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 uh, if, uh, 
you know, you might feel more comfortable because you are tall. I have a very tall husband, six foot four. He he never wants to stand because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to stand out and he doesn't want to make his physical presence oppressive. So he actually is very he appreciates sitting down. For me, sitting down is you know I actually. <laughs> I think it just feels, I, I mean, I'm, I'm fighting all, the, all my life against my physical stature, being the smallest person in class every year, you know. So these are, so for me, standing and presenting empowers me. And so I just realized, again, we have so many, we shouldn't make, there's, you know, I think we're in a beautiful age in which now we can recognize um, not, you know, one size doesn't fit all, and, and we really can customize these things, especially in the context of architectural pedagogy. I think we have the real ability to be more nuanced about it, so I think we need to take that up and um, use that in our studio and jury presentations. You know, in the, in the uh, film by Lu Khan's son about his father, Lu Khan, called My Architect, there's that scene in there where it's the classic scene, it's Lu Khan sitting at the end of the table, and it's all the men, they're all, and they're all you know, they're just all looking at him, and, and and I'm thinking, oh no, you know that that's not that's not what we want to do in the studio. Um, the couple things that I see is that one is is that I I for the most part cherish the one on one situation. So when I'm teaching class, one on one, I have between 16 and 12 students. I have 12 right now, so it's actually easier to do and you have four hours to do it. And that is, that is the most important part I feel about the education because I have to sort of take one hat off and put another one on and be present with that individual because there's, every person is different and they, they come to the problems different, they have different things to say, they have different ideas and it's really important for me to spend that one-on-one -on -one time and, and not think about that other image. And the other one was, in terms of juries, um, I noticed that there are people in my studio whose, whose voices are the opposite of mine. And they're very, very uh, low. And the first thing that happens from a juror is they say, could you speak up? And as soon as someone says, a juror says that, everything starts going downhill. <laughs> and I just see it over and over again. And so next term, they don't know it, but I'm gonna sneak in this microphone. <laughs> and because if you think about it, you know, Rosa Shang out of San Francisco is really famous for this. And she talked about what equity, equity really means. It's the baseball field where the tall person is tall enough to look over, the next person needs a stool, and the other person needs a ladder. And they can all see the game, so they can all see it. But wouldn't that be the same? If, if I gave her a microphone and she could speak as loud as I could, wouldn't that, make, wouldn't that be equal? I mean, what's wrong with that? So I'm going to try to sneak it in. I'll, let, I'll report back and let you know. <laughs> Maybe everyone has to have a microphone. Um, so we, uh, we have a minute left, but I, right now is that there's a break of, in one minute, but I actually wanted to um, uh, open the room for uh, like one or two questions and, that we can go through really quickly, and then we'll take like a five minute coffee break. Ten minute coffee break. Uh, we can make it fifteen minutes too. But why don't we see uh, if we can take one question now, and there'll be a lot more opportunity at the end of this event. But any any questions at the moment? Yes, in, uh, in the back. Hi, <laughs> um, Damon. You made a comment earlier about how you can't change people's minds, and as an educator, how does that guide how you approach educating people knowing that certain things that you talk about, their minds are already made up, and how does that make you feel after you have that mindset? Like, where do you get fulfillment in educating when you know some people's minds are already made up? That's a really hard question, but one of the things I did at the AIA that I truly saw some hope in this area is, and don't take this as 
diversity training because I don't believe in that per se because diversity training is a nomenclature that allows someone to listen to information to go on one ear and come out the other ear. But when you talk about unconscious bias, we're starting to break a little ground there because when you help people understand that everyone has biases and unconscious biases, then I start to see some of those not totally breaking the barriers down, but some people beginning to realize that their biases have an effect on people and, and that uh, it begins to start to change some of those minds a little bit. And um, I'm not an unrealistic person, you know, in that respect. Um, I've, I've, I've worked with some really wonderful people and and I've seen even some of the friends I started my career with was, who were a bit challenging, who have taken many decades to evolve into, um, you know, they're always comfortable with me because I believe in them, but to be, I think, in a more reasonable, comfortable position. But for me, what I'm really trying to say is that in the, in the issues of uh, racism and justice and things like that, you actually cannot know what's in the mind of other people all the time. You, you really, sometimes they have actions that make it really clear, but for the most part, you really don't know what they're thinking. So that's where this whole notion inside of me is that, you know, I listen to people really quite carefully and also recognize that my own personal strength has to be first. You know, how I deal with situations, how I communicate with people has to be first. And if, you know, we're going to get, meet them halfway from, from there for it. Thank you. And uh, we'll take additional questions around 4.45 p.m. Um, and we're, we're going to take a break now for uh, 15 minutes. is tangled with all of the cords here. Um, I can give you the clicker if you want to stay there. Costa. 
Um, and I guess perhaps this was due uh, to the fact that she's very difficult to categorize as a modernist. Um, and she now is getting some overdue recognition. Uh, Sejima displayed uh, her work at the 2010 Venice Biennale and with an AA exhi exhibition in 2012, naming her as one of the last humanists. So I thought that was appropriate for our conversation today. Um, Lina was born in um, Aquilina Bo in Rome in 1914 and worked for architect Gio Ponti. She set up her practice in Milan, uh, which really, it actually never prospered and ended with its premises, which were uh, destroyed in bombings in 1943. She joined the Underground Communist Party, assisted in the Italian resistance, and edited the magazine Domus, where one of her editorials on urbanism attracted the attention of the Gestapo. Mm -hmm. So um, after the end of the war, she toured Italy and um, chronicled the damage that occurred to many buildings by the fighting. Um, Bobardi immigrated then to Brazil in 1946, and then as a young nation, um, Brazil was a very attractive place for her. In 1951, she became a naturalized uh, Brazilian citizen. And she's referred to now as one of the most important prolific intellectual architects working in Latin America in the 20th century. Deeply, very deeply committed to the promotion of social and cultural potential in architecture, she transformed the cultural scene in Sao Paulo as um, she organized exhibits, she was editor of an art and architecture magazine and designer of some of the more significant um, <coughs> Brazilian pieces of architecture, in, in particular the SDSC uh, Cultural Center, which I was going to show you today. Um, this uh, SESC Pompeia Leisure Center was the defining, I think, project for Bobardi's career. With this project, she was able to synthesize her humanitarian approach to design um, in this community facility at a neighborhood scale. She transformed 19 abandoned industrial sheds um, located in Sao Paulo into a vibrant community center. And in addition to these sheds, she created two new concrete towers which house sports facilities and function as an urban landmark. So with an area of about 16,500 square meters, the size of the building complex corresponds to that of, let's say, a small industrial village. The former factory buildings were offered to the architect as a site for demolition um, by the client, which is the uh, service, the social service of commercial um, of Brazil, which is a nonprofit organization. But Bobardi decided to keep the original structure, um, but invert it programmatically. So she reappropriated this space of work into loosely, loosely programmed um, places of leisure. So the existing buildings now host arts and crafts workshops, an auditorium, a bar, a restaurant, a library, exhibition space, multi-purpose space for public, um, as well as the, the uh, uh, let's say sports activities, including swimming pool, gymnasium, dancing, and wrestling. And I think this was in direct contrast to the way that one might program, let's say, a, a stadium building today. Um, she really wanted to actually use program to invigorate other ways of addressing um, community and the unused factory. We're probably most familiar with this, the brutalist towers that are um, quite amazing, um, as kind of signs of this, uh, in a way they were direct in opposition to the high rises of the city, and they form a kind of emblem of the SESC on the skyline, and they were you know, built of this sort of raw, tough concrete. And in the towers, as I said, there are, there are swimming pools in the basement, four gyms stacked upon one another. Um, and the smaller tower houses the staircase and the services. And the towers are connected by, on each floor by these uh, Y or V-shaped bridges. On the interior, Bobardi took out the partition walls of the old industrial brick buildings to create this fluid interior space. And the open space has a temporary exhibition area, a library, a multi-purpose space with a long undulating lake, uh, which is a kind of allusion to um, the, the uh, South Francisco River, which is in Brazil. And so her approach was quite revolutionary at the time, you know, what we would refer to now very commonly as adaptive reuse. Um, but it really marks a paradigm shift 
in thinking about historical structures in Brazil. The project positive renovation as an eligible strategy for urban sites. This also marked a move away from modernism, modernism's very clean slate, um, a, a, a clean slate approach. And um, you know, she was very interested in creating the dialogue between the old and the new. So the, this approach could be deemed contemporary, very contemporary, I think, in today's sustainable and socially conscious approaches to architecture. The adaptive reuse of the factory, the poetic assemblage of old and new, the intentional social and cultural programming at the heart of the project deems architecture as a true agent of social change. Um, and the cultural complex supports the residents of the poor neighborhood with cultural and sports facilities while maintaining some kind of identity, memory, and history of the place. So the principles that, that, that drove Lino Bobardi's passions remain, I think, just as pertinent today um, as they were at the peak of her career over three decades ago. So it, to me, is an architecture that favors humanism without advocating iconic form. Um, a desire to breathe new life into historic buildings, a fascination with local materials and craft, and a profound commitment to the belief in the architect as an agent of that social change. Um, she, there's been a lot of exhibitions on her work now. I think she's, again, very interesting. Um, and it was said that together, the city's, the architect's, the architect's attitude in a way, is her greatest legacy. And I think that's um, it's profoundly ahead of her time and maybe promoting a kind of cultural sustainability in the broadest sense. Thank you. Um, we're going to move along. Uh, uh, these presentations take around five to seven minutes, so that was great. Um, so now we have... <laughs> And yeah. Hi. So thank you again, everyone, for being here and for Laura for inviting me to organize this symposium and to be panelists. My very, very short talk today is titled Symphoesis Making Ken and Making Wiz. And this talk takes its name from a book by Donna Haraway, Staying with Trouble, Making Kin in the Jethula scene, where Haraway says that bounded individualism in its many flavors in science, politics, and philosophy has finally become unavailable to think with, truly no longer thinkable, technically or any other way. She goes on to cite anthropologist Mary Lynn Strathern, who says, it matters what ideas we use to think other ideas. And I think this is important to what we're talking about here today, um, because I think architecture needs new terms to think with about, think with and to think about processes of equity. Haraway goes on to say, um, to describe one such term, which is symphoesis which means making with. She says, nothing makes itself. Nothing is really autopoeic or self-organizing, which I think gives us a way into discussing what might be some poetic work in architecture, knowing that we already have available the discourse of autopoiesis. So in this spirit, instead of completed buildings, I'm going to conflate questions four and six a little bit. Um, and show three process-based projects of women working collaboratively with robotics, which I think might get to this notion of the simple of humans and non-humans uh, possibly working together and presenting case studies for future architecture of what it might mean to make with. This first project is Manus by Madeline Hannon. It's a set of 10 industrial robots that are programmed to behave like a pack of animals. While well, each robot moves in and I'll let her robot With the past 50 years of promises and potential are finally coming to fruition. And robots are leaving the lab to live in the wild with us. <laughs> What I find so exciting about this era is that our future with these intelligent, autonomous machines has really yet to be written. When I 
sit down to design an interface with an industrial robot. I look for its native features that I can use for communication. So things like their posture, their motion, or even the sound of their motors can all be harnessed to build a body language that can better communicate with the people around them. When a group of robots are imbued with these behaviors, they begin to feel less like manufacturing equipment and more like a pack of mechanical creatures. Production of custom, quiet, and cooperative variety of task specific robots. It proposes a collaborative system of three robots of what she terms two species, again, uh, recalling Harway, introducing the dis discourse of robot ecologies, moving beyond using biology as merely a source of convenient metaphor or a superficial formal repertoire toward observing fabrication strategies as relationships between organisms and their environment where organisms are machines and environment is the construction site. Um, for many, 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 many years, and I think Stahl um, 
which addresses this question of the non-conforming body as kind of the outcome. And again, to understand how the sort of normalized, standardized things through which we make architecture are, in fact, imbued with sets of assumptions that we don't think about. And we were talking very early on about the problem of not having enough, like, for example, now, women's rooms, um, historically within, like, schools of architecture. So Avery, where I teach at Columbia University, was all male, so there were no women. Um, so women's rooms, right, um, weren't there. Women weren't supposed to be in those spaces. So, so, so the emergence of the modern bathroom, in fact, particularly in public, was gender. We also know that bathrooms were sites of, um, of uh, struggles, for example, um, for African Americans in the South because Jim Crow segregation, you know, would not allow white bodies and black bodies to, in fact, use the same bathroom. So that's, you know, that's so that's another nexus of power. Um, we have questions around disabilities, bathrooms that can be accessible to those um, who have various kinds of disabilities, and and so that led to a kind of radical rethinking of like how we design bathrooms. Um, uh, and then, you know, and I think this is what sparked it, the question of trans bathrooms, right? Um, Non-gender conforming bathrooms. So that the, the bathroom in a way, which we find is ubiquitous, is in fact a perfect example to show how these questions, let's say around gender, gender sexuality, race, ability, coalesce. And so, um, Joe really launched this project, I think, with an amazing group of people. Susan Schreiker, who's a well-known queer theorist, um, works on, um, on trans issues. Um, uh, Terry uh, Kogan, who's an attorney, and I'll explain why that was important. And a really amazing group of collaborators, uh, Chip Coe, Kate, Caitlin uh, Valeda, uh, Edward Long, um, and uh, Marco Liz. And it's, it's a research project um, that looked at a number, one, to identify the user groups, to think about, through design research, how these things are, are, are um, sifted through, and then to figure out a series of design elements. And that also meant thinking about the bathroom in more broadly terms that people use bathrooms for um, breastfeeding. Uh, people use bathrooms, for example, if you're diabetic or have to take some form of medication. Religious people use it for ablutions. Like the bathroom actually really is a very complex social space. It's not merely for elimination. Um, and so they started to think about how do we begin to reconfigure that space. Um, and so they developed a prototype, for example, for an airport, which you can imagine would have the heavily traffic with a diverse group of bodies that, for example, are non-conforming. Um, and then to think about like, how you would begin to organize a space that then could kind of accommodate the many kinds of bodies and uses of the space called um, the, the bathroom. Um, and so, you know, it has a series of, of layers, you know, an area that is for elimination, um, a, a, an area that can be for washing, and then a space for grooming. So it's a kind of layered um, spatiality um, uh, that one could kind of walk within and then walk out of and also have areas in which people um, would linger. Um, and so thinking about the various kinds of uh, questions around privacy, um, not having, as we know, in the U.S. stalls that basically expose your feet and the sounds, and, and really trying to think about the ways in which bodies, um, different kinds of bodies engage in traditions and cultures, uh, utilize these spaces. Um, uh, this is uh, another um, kind of segment around uh, grooming, um, the spaces for breastfeeding, um, and then also um, washing, right? And so you can have things that are the height for somebody who might, for example, be in a wheelchair or for a child, or, right? So to recognize, and so it doesn't necessarily have to be a distinct station, but kind of thinking of a kind of continuous thing that modulates according to. Uh, different needs, and you can start to see this relationship uh, sexually as well. Um, one of the reasons they had to bring in a lawyer, for example, is because, again, these differences are structural. They're literally baked into the building code. So in order to do something like this, you have to actually get a variance in order to do it. And so one of the things that they've actually done is they've actually transformed the national building code in order to be able to accommodate propositions like this. Um, which I think will go into effect in 2021. Um, so it takes some time, but that will then trickle down into local codes, for example. Um, but that shows you the degree to which these kinds of questions around gender are literally codified 
into the laws that we engage with um, every, every day. Um, but I wanted to show you um, a particular project, a version of the project, um, that in fact was constructed. Um, uh, this is for Gallaudet University um, in Washington, D.C., which some people may know. It's a school for the hearing challenge, for the deaf, but, you know, very, various forms of disabilities. And they actually be became very much interested, this is the uh, campus architect, um, in how do you respond, how do you create environments, again, that are, do not form the, the question of the standardized, right, that can be non-normative. Um, for example, when you're signing, you know, you need various sight lines, right? It's a very, you know, it's a different spatial configurations. And one of the things they became interested in uh, was a book by Lisa Finlay called Building Change, you know, that again is looking at the cultural specificity that architecture um, adapts to in particular situations around the world. Um, and so Joel um, at the campus art architect, um, and they sort of commissioned uh, uh, um, the group to actually do a project. Um, and uh, this is essentially what it looks like. You can see it's a much more compact one, um, but nonetheless it has the same you know, sort of areas of grooming, a social space, an area of elimination. And I think what's interesting about this, this is a kind of typological experiment, a sort of beta project. They're now sort of scaled up and doing a project uh, called the Mixed Museum. So, you know, working with museums in the United States and um, elsewhere around the world to start to think about how can museums begin to address diverse audiences, particularly through, through architecture. So, thank So the project I want to talk about has to do with um, low-income housing, or, or there are various names for that. And uh, it has to do with a specific region in Tucson, which is uh, sometimes referred to as South Tucson. And South Tucson was considered one of the poorest areas. It's one of the oldest. Uh, it's got a rich history of uh, Mediterranean revival. I still refer to the Mediterranean revival architecture at a very small scale. And what happened was sometime in the 70s, they built the Tucson Convention Center. And by doing that, and all the parking that goes with it, cut it, it cut off the South Tucson area from the rest of the downtown, which is actually above all this. So what happened was initially it became rent run down, but now there's sort of a resurgence. And you see this in a lot of cities where, um, in the word sometimes we use as gentrification, but essentially everyone sees an opportunity now to use this area and it's, it's pricing everyone out. But it has this rich history of this uh, uh, Mediterranean revival architecture at a very small scale and is, is also augmented by amazing murals and signage. And it has this very nice, very intimate culture that is uh, at the ground plane, uh, very, very uh, welcoming, walkable, safe, somewhat safe now. Uh, and, and now every, everyone wants to move there. So what happens is when, when this happens, you price all the low-income people out of the market and you end up with a different problem. So this project I'm showing you is actually part of our class. This is a sophomore studio, and we proposed to them to take four sites in this area and to look at what we call the domestic domain. So in this situation, I just wanted to say that uh, in my experience of doing uh, low-cost housing, What's the difference between low-cost housing and regular housing? Well, if you're not careful, you could dive into substandard housing, which is something that you must resist. So it has to meet the same standards of housing structurally, sound transmission, uh, all the things that normal, normally would be available in market housing. And uh, the main thing, you only have a few choices. So. In a warm climate like this one, and also in Tucson, you can eliminate the corridors because the corridor becomes the outside of the building. So that's something you can't do in, in Minnesota, for example. 
and that lowers the house the cost of the housing. The other thing that we began to investigate is what we call the domestic domain, which is how much are people willing to change the way they live in order to share certain amenities. So the first thing you do is um, you make, uh, excuse me, you make uh, the unit smaller. So this whole notion of a small unit is one that uh, we see it, we see that everywhere on television in form of uh, the mini house or uh, container house or any of these other ideas, but we need to find a way to, to make sure that we had uh, actually a universal bathroom was one of the requirements and that we had a place to both to make food, to sleep, and to live, and it had to have those three components so you just couldn't make one big room out of the space. And then the second one, and that's for a studio, so that studio could be anywhere from a homeless person subsidized in some way, or someone who's willing to live in a very small space. And then we had a one bedroom version of it, which is bigger, and we, our team in our class started to look at, kind of, this actually came from the students in some way, to look at what we call the super wall. So the super wall is like a transformer. You know, you can pull out the, the bed, I mean, you can pull things out of it. You can pull out the ironing board, the refrigerator's in it, the cooking's in it, your closet is in it, and you make this 24 inch deep transformer, and it can be all kinds of things, and it saves a lot of space, and allows you to give more open space to, to people, and a little bit more privacy. So uh, this student, Kaya Orana, uh, did a really nice job of, um, uh, putting these together. And so now what you're seeing actually on the first floor is what we call the collective domain. So this is the spaces where we're actually providing a larger kitchen where the people who live in smaller units can actually cook together and do things together. And so you're actually sharing. And so there's this notion of um, people live in different arrangements. They have partners or they don't have partners. They live by themselves. They have children and they have no children. And so you have all these other amenities that are uh, common laundry, common cooking, and some other things that, uh, that are a little bit different. And then we were work, she's working on a uh, stacking arrangement that allows these things to work better. And on the second floor, she, she actually wanted to make sure that there's a space where you, when you can actually meet your neighbor, neighbor, so you're not totally isolated from the next person. So the next, uh, there's one other student here I'm going to show, and her approach is a little bit different. It's a, it's a modular approach, and the units are slightly smaller. But again, they're trying to create these four major areas, and it's such a small area. So this is something like 400, 450 square feet. So the, the uh, project set between 350 and 500 square feet, so it's really small. Uh, but we, again, we want to emphasize an accessible bathroom um, for elderly and so forth. So in this case, the whole idea of the collective domain, whereas these are the domestic domain, are the individual units, in the collective area, she went a, a bit further and created a very dynamic group kitchen where you could do an, uh, sort of teaching, uh, cooking, healthy cooking, and then created sort of an indoor-outdoor space between where it's almost like a bar, almost, if you will, where, the, where you, you all have seen this, where you could but it's really more of a community space where people can kind of interact from the inside to the outside and roll it up when the, when the weather is uh, bad. But it also, the thing about this is that it created a community within a community, so it's sort of a subspace within the bigger neighborhood, and you could open up the edges and invite people in and have like a little market and begin, you know, this is, the reason why I picked this project is about communication and not shutting off the neighborhood from your zone, but you're actually reaching out and enjoying it in, with the neighborhood and trying to maybe sell your wares or, or have an art fair or something where, and then at night you could actually close it up because one of the things that we talked about in our studio is the sense of safety and you have to have areas of your, your home that you can defend. So defend, defensible area is not a negative word is just saying that you want to be able to see what is around your environment and that you can protect both yourself and everyone else within, within that environment. 
She, she would have went further, and it has a lower garden, but also has an upper garden as well to, uh, for people to share space together. And she decided to embrace this, the uh, um, Spanish Mediterranean revival to its fullest as an architecture student. And, and this is, in sophomore, this is the first project they've ever done that was a building. So this is, you all remember in school, I don't know where all of you are, but this is where you do all kinds of abstract projects, but this is their first building ever. So um, it's kind of a, it was a neat project for them to get involved in, but also you can see its context here with the neighborhood, trying to keep it at the same scale and have openings and make it porous uh, to again promote communication and, and community. <laughs> This question is going over time a little bit, but that's okay. Um, I think what we'll do, yeah, next, we have two more questions. Uh, the remaining two questions will will shorten the time slightly. We'll try to be finished around 4:45 still. So when I originally agreed to answer this question, I thought that it was, you know, I was like, oh yeah, I'll think of an equitable project. And it turned out to be a lot harder than I thought of. Um, I was, you know, for a few days, I was thinking like, oh my gosh, what is an example of a gender equitable project? How do I not know a single equitable project? This is absurd. So after doing some research and um, thinking about a class that I'm taking right now, which is called Cultural Landscapes, and thinking about the kind of um, daily spaces that we interact with, not necessarily on the scale of whole projects, I decided that I wanted to engage with the question of the city. And in my research, I found a really compelling example of kind of integrating gender equity at a city scale. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so in 1991, in the city of Vienna, um, Ava Kyle and a group of a variety of diverse female planners arranged a photography exhibition that was called Who Owns Public Space? Women's Everyday Life in the City. And this exhibition basically followed the paths of a variety of women across their days throughout the city, just showing kind of the everyday spaces that they interacted with. And it turned out to be a surprise, like smash success. Um, like thousands of people attended the exhibition and it really got people thinking about the way that women engage with public space in the city. So I think in the next year or so, a survey was sent out by the Democratic Socialist Party in um, Austria and it revealed that two-thirds of um, car journeys made in the city were made by men, and only one-third of car journeys were by women, which kind of revealed that women in the city were engaging with transportation systems in different ways and got people thinking about the way that the city had been very structured around this kind of concept of, you know, the working man driving to work and then driving home from work, and that's kind of like the journeys that happen. So, um, in starting to think about how women engage with the city differently, um, this project ar arose. It's called um, the Freunde Stadt, if I pronounce that German right. Um, so, following the rise of the Iron Curtain, the Viennese government um, had made a plan to contract 30,000 new housing units per year. And so at the time of this project's conception, 30 of those proposals had already been fielded and not a single one had been by a woman. So the idea for this competition was to design a housing development by and for women. Um, so three female designers worked on this project and by conducting a variety of research, they took into account specific needs of women in the city. So, um, they realized that things that were really lacking for women in public space and in their housing were um, issues of safety, community, convenience of schools and shopping. Um, they also wanted to make sure that it had very customizable floor plans so that um, it could serve people at all kind of stages of family life and ages. Um, so this was the final project that resulted. 
And this is just a list of some of the considerations that they took into account. Um, they wanted to facilitate housework and family tasks, promote good neighborly contacts, create a housing environment where residents could move safely at night, have the widest possible range of flat layouts. Um, they wanted to be able to accommodate people with lower incomes, have a range of private and semi-public spaces, a good range of social infrastructure, and promote the work of women planners. So we'll start to unpack some of that stuff a little bit as we go on. Um, but I want to just move on and talk about how they kind of expanded this, um, this initiative, which they came to call gender mainstreaming. And it's basically about um, mainstreaming public space in considerations of gender. So over the next, or I guess to date, they've um, enacted over 60 pilot programs of gender mainstreaming in the city of Vienna. Um, a few examples are improving street, life, street lighting for safety. Um, they've changed traffic light patterns to prioritize pedestrians. They've increased um, public seating and benches to encourage older people to linger longer and participate in public life. Um, installing elevators and ramps and to um, facilitate wheelchairs and strollers in public space. Um, and then a really interesting one has to do with parks. Um, a study that they conducted found that after the age of nine, girls' um, usage of parks was dramatically dropping off, and it was mostly boys who were um, remaining in the sphere of the park because they were monopolizing it, basically. Um, and so by installing more areas for seating in public parks, they actually found that they gave these groups of little girls a lot more of an opportunity to have kind of claim their own space in the sphere of the park, and their um, usage actually really increased. So, um, another thing that they've enacted is something called gender budgeting, where since 2005, any new developments have to make their case to the government that they benefit women and men equally. And uh, to date, the UN has um, designated Vienna's kind of gender mainstreaming as best practice for um, city planning. So, um, you can see that this is definitely a super progressive initiative, but it's also not without um, its issues. Um, moving forward, Vienna needs 130,000 new residential units by 2025, and some of these kind of some of the good aspects of these planning practices are having to start to fall by the way by the wayside. Overall, though, I would also ask the question: Is this enough? Is this strategy enough? Um, is it enough for women? Is it enough to address only the symptoms of the things that make the city dangerous for women, or do we need to address the root causes of that inequity, many of which are larger than just the scale of gender? Um, additionally, I'm sure you've noticed as I've been presenting on this, many of these measures focus on planning for the traditional notion of women with families, um, you know, the working mother doing housework, that sort of thing. This is largely because many of the studies that they conducted found that was what was lacking for women in the um, public space of Vienna, but I feel that this strategy kind of essentializes the experience of an entire demographic of people and says, all right, this is what's best for women um, into one like streamlined solution. So I think we need to be designing not only for different types of women, but for different types of people overall. Um, I would also ask the question, is this enough for everyone else? Um, I think about trans women whose experiences are definitely not being accounted for in this gender mainstreaming initiative, and for trans women, living in the city is more dangerous than perhaps any other demographic of people. Um, what about queer people overall? What about people of color? How can we account for all of these different unique experiences? And to kind of represent this, I would turn to an example of a suburban project in Vienna called Aspirin. It's this residential district that was designed and has been called this kind of feminist utopia because all of the streets are named after women. Is, is that enough? Is that all we have to do to make our cities equitable? I don't, I don't know, I don't think so. Um, so I think we have to be careful of these kind of political performative gestures. Um, it's of course radically important that Vienna has been able to involve so many women in its planning and design process and they've made it an institutionalized priority to account for this. Um, but it's equally as important to make sure that we're really following through on these initiatives, interrogating them, and making sure that they're really helping as many people as possible, and they're not just a hollow representation contributing um, to perpetuating the structures that already exist. 
Um, I would like to turn maybe specifically to the question of queer people in design, which we've been kind of talking around a little bit throughout um, the course of the day, but um, I think turning to that issue, queer architects definitely can be included in the process now, right? I know many queer architects who are super successful and do really interesting work, but is just being represented enough? Um, I was able to take Adam's class last semester, which many of our student participants today were also in, called Queering Architectural Taste. And we talked a lot about the question of um, queer architecture. What is it? Does it exist at all? Um, while there are certainly queer architects, I fear that due to the continuing power structures, we're not able to explicitly design for queerness and for queer people. So in closing, I want to share some words from um, Adam Nathaniel Furman on how we can move past the concept of just representation and into utilizing our radical potential. So I'm about to hit you with a block of text, but I will read it. Um, as a queer architect, you can write essays in academia and you can live your life openly while working in an office that produces the cadaverous brick silos of contemporary British architecture. But God forbid you try to express yourself, your community, your background, and your life through your architecture. In this respect, we might as well be in the 1950s. Modern times have not been a beacon of utopic acceptance. If you turn yourself into a harmless joke, a throwaway stereotype, if you neutralize your radical potential, you are allowed to exist in plain sight. This court gesture or lovable freak role is not acceptance, it is ritual humiliation, and it is currently the only way an architect may operate in a mode that is not completely disown his, her, they, their, them, z, c, her, co, or a's radical and innate difference. So I think that if we can take these lessons from Vienna about including women in the design process, but kind of subvert it, not just to be a token woman or queer person in the design process, not just a lovable court jester, but apply the innate radical potential of our identity to make a better, more equitable city for everyone, not just women, but everyone, I believe that we have a real chance at changing the world through the power of design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was really great, amazing. Thank you for bringing up the issue of uh, queer architects and queer taste in this discussion explicitly. Um, we do have to move to the next topic. We have two more, so it's going to be a little tight, but um, let's, let's try to give 22 minutes per topic, because it's 4.10. Um, okay, so if we could be joined by Lynn. The question is, what do minority students, faculty members, and professionals need from allies in order to foster more inclusive academic studios and practices? What does alliance look like for people of color, women, non-binary, queer people, uh, etc.? May I ask the student answer this one for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I felt like I read that now. To listen on this one. I don't know. Um, do you guys have opinions? Um, for me, um, I thought that Erin's response earlier about listening is really important. Um, I think that's something that we've kind of like danced around and like talked about throughout this whole um, panel. But like, when you really think about listening, it's a, it's difficult to practice. Um, in one of my women and gender studies classes, um, an activity we would do is called babbling, where um, we'd walk around, we'd find a partner, and for three minutes, we just had to listen to them babble, like talk about their day, or talk, answer like this one prompt, and in doing that practice, I realized how hard it is to like actually truly listen. Not just listen, but listen and not, not like craft a response. Because like I feel like sometimes in a lot of conversations and dialogues, you're listening, but you're listening to craft a response. You're not fully just purely listening to like engage and process what the other person is saying. So I think first of all, listening is really important, and also taking in silence um, in a lot of conversations. Like for example, me like whenever I pause in between a sentence, I'm not 
that's not an invitation for someone else to interrupt me. That's me taking the space I need to like fully craft out my response and like think about things and think about things with intention. Um, another theme, like I, like people need to be intentional about the way they talk, the way they act. Um, and next step is like truly acting without being patronizing. Um, I, I am a student organizer here on campus. I work a lot with like administrators, with professors. Um, right now, the past few months, um, the campus has been, there's been a lot of sexual misconduct happening. Um, and I'm a student organizer. Uh, we've been working a lot to on Title IX reform, university policy procedures and um, at one of the sit-ins, um, you know, there, we were, it's just a group of students organizing a, a protest and um, it happened like last November and I remember it felt like it was us against the whole university, all faculty, all staff, all administrators. It was just like the five of us, like every single night for a month, like planning this protest, planning meetings with administrators up until like two in the morning. And like, keep in mind, like this was all during final speak. Um, and a lot of us were like balancing different jobs. And I remember like one of the protests that was like 10 to five, I was there the whole day. I didn't prepare a lunch. Like a lot of us did not prepare any time to rest. We were skipping classes. We didn't prepare meals. And faculty came and they brought food for us. And like, in that, like, you know, you think food is not, like, that's such a simple act, such a simple gesture, but it kept us nourished and it showed that, like, we were supported by a lot of people and it, it literally kept us alive throughout a whole day. Um, and I think that kind of moves into the next bit about alliance, like, what does solidarity look like and what does trying to balance power differentials or how do you say that word, um, look like. And when you think about alliance, like you Google it and you see, you always see like that handshake emoji. And it's usually like one person of a lighter skin tone and one person of a darker skin tone, like holding hands. Like we all know it. Like whenever I try to do like multicultural branding, I try to look up like, oh, like what are some other narratives we can follow besides that handshake? And there's literally nothing else and I'm always frustrated by it. But I think if we begin to think about alliance beyond this like physical touch, um, like alliance as um, kind of this exchange of energy and emotion and sympathy, like thinking about it as a moment, like I don't know, when I think about times I feel a lot in alliance with someone, it's always like this one moment of like shared community and like a shared moment. Like for example, like in the past month of organizing, like I would start my day at like 8 a.m. with like meetings with administrators, then go to class, then go to work, and then go to class again, and then back to work because I work on campus. And that would be like nine to six between my like class and work. And then we would plan, like organize the rest of the day. I would go to like school meetings and then my day ended at like 10, and then I like would work on my essays until like four in the morning, and then I'd wake up again at six to like, or like seven to meet with administrators. And I remember there was this one night where it was really, really like hard for all of us. My friends and I like, we like went back to like my friend's apartment to like grab some paper, some books. Um, and in between, we spent five minutes just like eating ice cream, like literally just five minutes eating ice cream together and that was the most normal we ever felt. And for me, like, like that's not the handshake emoji, but it's like even something, even a moment as intimate as that was like deeply like moving and it kept me going. So I think that's kind of my answer to that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess maybe to address some of both these topics, the questions of representation. I was, I started on the lecture series that I was a couple years ago, five years ago, 
And at least in the records we had available, we hadn't had gender parity in the lecture series. Um, so I had about 22,000 to 2015 available. So went out and got a grant to make it legitimate to do that. And then, you know, we, we achieved gender parity based on the people that we invited. And, you know, someone comes up later and is like, oh, but is this real diversity? You know? And so that opened up a lot of questions about representation and also whether someone wanted to, how to avoid tokenization. And then also what identity markers or identities are available to me if I'm inviting somebody to lecture. If their content isn't about queerness, then there's not always like a, like on their bio, it's not gonna say like, this is my sexual identity, this is my gender preference. So it might be pronouns. Um, or if someone's, um, how they acknowledge their ethnicity, for example. And I think it opened up a lot of questions of like, what would it look like to truly have a representative project team or a truly a representative lecture series or if representation is even the wrong metric for trying to engage as many diverse voices as possible because then I think that opens up questions of allyship of like whether or not someone's being a good ally if that's even where the conversation starts. If it's like, oh, we need to find someone who checks these three types of people, you know, like even the typing of people as problematic. So I think I've thought a lot about that notion of labeling because it's something that happens a lot when you um, write code. You have to label, especially when you're looking at like, social data. What does it mean to actually physically like, attach labels to people um, that becomes codified because then you've created data that says like people fit into certain labels and then that looks legitimized. So I don't know if that's a question maybe that kind of ties these things together because I think allyship can be challenging if you're not invited into it sometimes too, to assume that you are performing as an ally can be an overstep as well. And so um, we've had a lot of issues of race on our campus recently of some really horrible things being written and students have said they didn't feel supported and I think that as faculty that question of how they wanted to be supported and what that meant is something that we've really struggled with, with um, what that would look like. thinking about is um, uh, how this question for me does pose the, some, some kind of essential, um, let's say, acknowledgement of the stereotypes, stereotyping that seem to still be so deeply rooted. Um, at our school, we tried uh, at one point to initiate some, um, it was called DDI, the Dean's Diversity Initiative. And um, it was uh, a group of both students, faculty, all departments coming together, sending representation to brainstorm some of these issues. Um, and it was amazing that even in the context of a thematically um, focused conversation about how to debunk some of the issues, it was fascinating that, that immediately a group of faculty and students jumped onto the idea, well, the way to solve this is to start teaching courses in which um, you know we really make um, low-cost social housing um, you know like the issue that we just you know just uh, look at in the studio like that should be core two's pedagogy and um, and that will really get at and I, it was amazing because at this incredible moment of dialogue and everybody talking over each other I thought that was a great idea. An African American student said, "You know, I didn't come here actually to learn about social housing. I'm really interested in computational design." So, like the assumption, assumptions that people were bringing to the table even were so amazingly laden. And, and then another another African American said, like, "Where do you think I'm from? Like, there's just an assumption that there, and it was." It was a stunning moment, actually. I mean, the room fell silent because everybody realized that they had fallen into the into the uh, a kind of stereotypical um, thinking that uh, was just so pervasive and very difficult to dislodge. Um, 
So I guess that uh, um, it's probably a non sequitur to be kind of this is sort of a running stream of consciousness. I, I guess the other thing that I keep thinking about is that um, we often talk about the ways to make alliance through inclusion and make, you know, and sometimes that does unfortunately look a little bit like tokenism. Uh, but for women, because I can speak from this perspective, I'm very concerned about the perception of alliance actually disguising itself. Um, but really what it is is gender tax. Um, I'm really concerned about how women are being asked to do more service work, more um, uh, things that actually they're being pegged continually to do things that uh, are border on the administrative and the secretarial. Um, and um, there's an idea that, oh, well, you're actually bringing them into an alliance with other other activities, but in fact what you're doing is you're just taxing them because they're women. So they get burdened with more of, um, I, so I, I, I guess I'm not, I'm neither here nor there, it's kind of a stream of consciousness, but I'm, I'm concerned about these issues of stereotyping and how alliance um, uh, is in true alliance. And, um, and then I'm thinking about the comments that you made, which are really incredible, and um, make me think that there are probably some really small acts that can be read, like food, which I think is really interesting, that can um, bring together the kind of um, right brain, left brain, intellectual, and low, uh, low bar kind of things that would be very, um, at the end of the day, there's a reason why you actually feel closer to somebody when you've had a meal with them. So I actually think there's some other ways of thinking about this. Um, that I think are probably at some base level um, rather than something that's constructed um, to appear like something else. Um, any more? Uh, we, we can take on, oh, Damon, did you want to say something? Sure. <clears throat> well, I, I was wondering As students, this is really more towards students, what's the value of working together? Now, you all know that on this campus, there are groups of students that work together. They may be fraternities or sororities or some other groups. And um, I'm working with a few students right now, and I asked them to actually, they're all coming to me sort of individually, and I asked them to to, did you ever consider working together? And because some of it is, is, is really on a peer-to-peer -peer basis seems to me to have some strength to it. So for example, there's just this little issue in the sophomore year about line weight. You know, sort of, okay, we have that rhino issue. <laughs> I, think, I think I hit on something there. So we, we introduced rhino to our students in sophomore year as well. And, and, you know, when you're thinking about drawing by hand and line weight is a concept in and of itself, but then when you switch to CAD, the whole notion of the concept of line weight changes because you're dealing with the virtual world and the printed world are, as I sometimes say, miles apart from each other and they must be converged in order for you to have understanding about what you're, you're producing something that you really want to see. And I just felt that if the three of you could just get together and, and say, as peers, and say, look, you know, I talked to the professor, this is something that he really thinks is powerful, and then the others could see it, and, and you know, they could increase the sort of um, understanding amongst themselves, and then eventually take that to another level and start thinking about how can this be sort of an excellence committee, if you will, you know. It's just take that up to another level. So. Now, I'm saying that what we're doing is, we're starting a NOMA chapter, I'll just get right to the chase. So we're, we're starting a NOMA chapter at University of Arizona, it's never had one before. And, uh, and, and that in itself is not a panacea, it's not like the answer or anything, but the, the, the thing is, is that what, the way I wanted to present that to the students is this way. We're about to start a collective conversation about equity. Who wants to show up? We didn't say they had to be a certain color. We didn't say they had to be a certain identity. We didn't say they had, you know. And you would be surprised who shows up. It's a lot of people. 
and, and, it's, and they all want to work together. Now, wouldn't that in some ways seem like a powerful trajectory for like success for some people who are really looking for that? And I, I'm hoping that it will, and, um, and I believe it will. I didn't have that opportunity because it just wasn't enough of us at all. But uh, I think it's going to be positive in our case. Um, did you want, uh, we have a couple minutes if you want. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just make a, maybe just a quick um, observation statement. You know, over, you know, being within many different institutions, working within practice, um, you know, realize in terms like diversity and inclusion, I think to your, I think your point, um, prior uh, around tokenism, because sometimes the, the term inclusion doesn't necessarily dismantle again like the power structures and the institutional ways. And I think exactly that example, let's just bring in housing. It's like, okay, I mean, like that doesn't, you know, it, it, it already operates with a set of assumptions. I was working on a project and we needed a title. Um, and I think the subtitle had been something like Unbuilding Race, and we felt like, no, that's not quite right. Um, but someone else within this big institution came back and said it has to be you know, justice. And, but the project's not about, I mean, justice is implicit in what we're doing, but that's not what we ask people to address. But because it was dealing with you know, African Americans and folks within the diaspora, that was assumed that that was the subject matter. Um, and, and, I, and I think that we, have, again, have to, to recognize the kind of structural reasons that that sometimes happens, and sometimes it's just institutional violence, right? And sometimes it's just like work outside the institution, find spaces of refuge, find spaces where you can commune, where you can work without having to constantly expending energy battling back <coughs> that, you know, these kinds of institutional structures that are just going to oppress you. And, and I think sometimes, you know, the rhetoric around inclusion diversity is it critical enough of the institutional hierarchies that are constantly putting pressure because, you know, it doesn't dismantle the kind of structural issues, especially in things like universities, which comes from the term universal, you know, which again is embedded in these Western epistemes, right, of, of domination. Um, and, and I think we have to really, really challenge that. And sometimes it's just, you've got to be elsewhere in order to do it. Um, I, I think we can move to the next one, um, and we're going to, uh, technically we should have 15 minutes with it, but we, we'll see. Um, <laughs> we, Let's give it a You can stay. Time. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll take our time with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> and Lauren is joining us now. So, looking towards the future, what are the tools, skill sets, mindsets needed to move this forward towards gender equity? Can architecture be made with a different mode, uh, a, a different mode of uh, inclusive set of tool, inclusive set of tools? Excuse me. That was the question. I can read it again. I got it. I was just waiting for more. I, I could jump in on this. I'll, sure. Then I'll be done. <clears throat> so, in AIA Arizona last year, we did a, our annual state meeting, and the focus was called user experience. So, my other degree in web design and media is a large part of that is actually on user experience. So I actually had a chance to, you know, I always look, I sought that second degree because I was interested in the contrast and congruencies between code design, in, uh, interface design, and architecture design, and how all this design works. But I have to tell you, in their world, it's all about user experience. And whenever you go to a website that functions extremely well or an app in your hand, it's gone through so much working with people to try to determine how it gets used. Uh, it's just overwhelming. And the reason why is because our attention span to, to micro 
digital information is so short that it, it demands that that kind of intensity of user experience has to happen. So I to answer your question, especially the second one, I want to say yes. You know? And I, I want to say yes because if we begin to probe into, and I know in the student design I showed, we talked about where does actually where actually does everyone stand in this room? Where do they reach for this object? And then you start digging down deeper and deeper and deeper. And when we talk about equity in housing, uh, for example, I was uh, you talked about Gallaudet earlier, and I, I've talked to those people too when I lived in Washington D.C. And you want to talk about a person who actually is deaf and their children are not. So how are you actually going to make a kitchen like that? See, it's a whole different, you have to start from, from zero. You have to think about, they, the person who's deaf has to see the lips moving of the both persons in the room who are not. So you actually have to stage the, the sink in a, in a perfect line between there and the dining room so that the people sitting at it, you know, there's all this, things that are going on that are really a part of more of a universal approach to design so that it fits a much wider variety. So my contribution to this question has to do with this whole notion of the user experience being a more prominent role in, in what we do as programming and, and designing, which we always have done. But in user experience, I just wanted to say also that it is also laden with testing. So you have to be able to test these things with real people in some cases in order to understand whether your choices are valid. So that's something as a designer in my career, I don't think we really did that. We did programming, we did all kinds of things about problem seeking. But user experience is a whole <coughs> other level that I think will bring equity in the way that we approach it. I focus my answer to, so these are all my notes for the first five questions. And then this last one, these are my notes for this. <laughs> so, so, and I actually decided that it would be interesting to focus on low-hanging fruit. Um, like, actually, from a very pragmatic, practical, like, what are some things, like, right off the top of the bat that we could do? So I'm going to list them, because other, if, I don't, if I explain too much, I'll be here to have all afternoon uh, take us away from my cocktails. Um, so, actually, so I grouped it into three lenses. And again, I think this is low-hanging fruit. I think you know, this is not the epitome of what we could do. And, and maybe, you know, but it, I think it speaks, hopefully it speaks to some of the ideals and the values that we're talking about today and that might um, uh, be enacted. Okay, so faculty lens, a practice lens, and a historical lens. Um, from a faculty lens, um, let's do some internal audits. Let's make sure compensation uh, is has been examined. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, let's, let's do some internal audits on service, on service roles. Who's doing what in, in every department? And that's pretty easy. It's quant stuff. Do it. Um, balance and diversify teaching teams. There should be no five five males and one female. Or one um, there should be specifically mentorship programs for different different uh, for women, for uh, minorities, um, for for queer. There should be mentorship programs set up for these kind of things. Um, feature women as keynotes, jurors, um, respondents, panelists. That's happening actually a lot more. That's great. Um, advocate for female leadership. Create reading lists on issues of, of glass ceiling and discrimination so that they become a repository and resource that's just accessible very quickly. Um, compile other resources related to gender, gender problems and implement fam, family-friendly work hours. Okay, so that's like from a faculty lens. Uh, from a practice lens, steer away from the double uh, standard modifier exceptional woman architect. Um, acknowledge the values, uh, the value-coded male-made spaces. Um, Create a greater awareness of connections between our work and the quality of lives. Um, you use your expertise actually to benefit other women. That could be very interesting. Acknowledging different professional values, promoting family uh, friend, friendly um, work environments in the professional world through actual workplace policy. Recognize female um, female male collaborations as well as male female collaborations. Um, and undo the genius impetus associated with men, and um, create competitions only open to women. Why not? I, I thought 
thought that was interesting. The Supreme Court um, said, well, why don't we actually, um, Ginsburg said, well, why don't we just have an all women Supreme Court? Okay. All right. <laughs> historical lens. <laughs> historical lens. Third. Um, so this is actually, again, a very low hanging fruit, and many, uh, many people have written about this. You know, first of all, obviously, attribution crediting women's architectural work, um, ensuring inclusion um, in prestigious architectural um, and theory, uh, history and theory anthologies. Um, acknowledge how, how architectural uh, studies subconsciously project traditional masculine standards. We've been talking about that a lot today. Um, create really room for listing the, uh, it feels sometimes like there's no, there's no place or room to make uh, references to women architects. Undo this missing attribution of joint authorship. That's, okay, we should just do that. Recognize the role of women clients. Women have been incredible patrons of architecture, and I think that's, an, that's, a, that's just like a cannonball. Um, because there's power and money affiliated with that. Um, and then, uh, of course, add women um, architects and designers to Wikipedia. Very basic, low hanging. <laughs> I, I think we'll just go as, as long as we need to on this one because I, I think um, these are like some very great takeaways. Um. Um, I, mean, I think this goes, there's two things I've been thinking a lot about. One is this question of attribution, and the second is the idea of pipeline theory. Um, the first being attribution, I think we keep coming back to this, it's both in the canon and then in how we award work. Um, and then I'm always very taken by the work um, that Mabel does with who makes who builds your architecture. And that actually has shown up in a lot of the work I've done in computation is that when you're using a software, computer software, there's uh, computer software code, you're building your work on other people's intellectual labor implicitly. So when I open up Rhino, uh, it's because of Bob McNeil. If I open up Grasshopper, it's because of David Breton. Like you're collaborating with those people in a way that's really undeniable and that I think really gives us um, a moment to undo this myth of you know, working on your own or a genius. Um, and so that's something I thought a lot about because it gives you a record that actually is a counter narrative to any idea that we make alone. And that's why I like the idea of making with instead of making for. Um, and that there's so much in our pedagogy that comes from a sort of Bauhaus redux and that kind of regurgitation of that or reworking. And the Bauhaus, Gropius didn't think women could work in 3D. So he sent them to the textile studios to work in textiles. And you get Annie Albers and you get the most talented <laughs> women. But if our pedagogies continue to be based on a legacy that in, like, very explicitly excluded female thought, I think that there's something really damaging there to say that we're not ready to be done with that. Um, this doesn't mean I want to like throw out color theory. It's very cool. But that we can't you know, just keep replicating things that we know don't work. And that goes to pipeline theory, which is, if you aren't familiar with the term, the idea if you just stuff enough women in the pipeline, which being like the profession, eventually this gender thing will sort itself out. So I was feeling very uh, unhappy one day. And um, that's a kind term. Um, and I was looking at the AIA numbers for licensure, and I was really hell-bent on getting licensed because I was like, I'm going to help the numbers. And when I graduated from undergrad, it was about 12% women. And I got, that was 2004, and I got licensed in 2015, and at that point we were at 18%. And so, you know, we're talking about Mabel having a 50% female class in 1981. And so I played those numbers out on just straight data, and I think I landed that if we continue that progress at that rate with no other, we don't change anything else, we just say like eventually it'll sort of out. I think it was 2093 to reach gender parity. And I was like, you know, that is just not okay. <laughs> and that's when I like got on my angry hat and was like, we really, if we know some things don't work, then we as institutions and as a profession have to stop. We have to make sure there's 
child care across the way. We have to make sure we're not teaching a canon that says that women were present because it's really challenging to sit down and try to create a syllabus that does a better job than the one that you were taught necessarily. But if we're not doing that work, we're going to keep showing like the same five white dudes who created modernism over and over again. <laughs> and then be like, man, I just don't think there's any women out there. You know, and you're like, so I mean, I think some of it's on the academy, but also on the profession to say if you continue to reward people instead of groups of people, it firms, cohorts, the laborers who made the architecture, that it isn't like one person wins, then kind of we can keep talking about it, but there's, those are things that I think really have to actively be changed and the people who are in positions of leadership say enough. If I could just add a little bit to, to that, Shelby. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of, I, I was just looking at NCARB uh, data um, from this year, and 39% um, of newly licensed um, architects were women this year. And in 2009, it was at 29%. So it is increasing, and I, I, I like your estimates. I'll also just add that uh, last year, my colleague, Jean Gang, um, just decided for the hell of it, you know, there's a lot of, um, protest at the GSD about gender issues. Um, there was big banners across all the trays. It was a really big, dramatic thing. Um, and, she, and that prompted her, just for the heck of it, to just use this algorithm and software that she had purchased and uh, to test her own practice. Now that's a woman-owned firm. You know, she's a MacArthur genius. She was shocked to realize that she was underpaying all her women. So, uh, like, when that was revealed to her, she obviously made amends. But the systematic um, quality to that is, it was, it was stunning. And I think, again, until you do the, the quantitative data uh, analysis, it, it wasn't clear. And obviously, once she did that, she could make some big changes. But it, it's really startling how that's the problem. Did she understand how that happened? She thinks that what happens is that that incrementally, what you know, like you know, a woman might get hired at just a little bit less, and then when they do like a salary increase at, at X percent, and then somebody gets mer meritoriously bucked, or somebody takes time off because they're having a baby, or something. So, so, so lots of things. But you know, and again, maybe the pile is tiny, or the pile is a little bit heavier. But at the end of the day, you have this person compared to this person, and if it was a woman, it was down here. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something actually I wanted to speak on. Um, my goal is to become a licensed architect, and by 2017, there were over 113,000 licensed architects in the U.S. However, there are only 400 African American women. Um, that's approximately 0.3 percent. And so, statistically, for me to find another person that looks like me, I would have to find a firm that employs 334 licensed architects. So this means that the people that I would report to, you, the principals, the people leading the meetings, the people um, that are making decisions probably won't look like me. And so relating this back to the question, in my, I hope for in my future, whatever position I'm in, whatever role I'm in, that I'm in an environment that allows that's encouraging for me, and that I can be engaged in where I feel valued. Um, and uh, uh, like another personal note is I have a friend from high, from high school. She um, goes to the University of North Texas. She has a 4.0. She plays D1 volleyball. She's an incredibly talented individual, and she's a business major. And we were talking about the classes we were taking. And one of the classes she decided to take was uh, to learn golf uh, so that she could <clears throat> be able to play with her, her coworkers. Um, and just trying to fit in within that culture. And so I hope that within the work culture that it can be engaging enough to where you don't need to find other ways to, to go out your way to allow yourself to fit in. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, no, I mean, I think that is an astounding um, statistic. I, I am not licensed, I will say. Um, but that statistic was somewhere when I finished, like 100. Um, and it's been a very, 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 very slow rise. Which isn't to say that there aren't, you know, black women who are out there engaged in forms of practice, but, you know, licensure is definitely a measure. And it's, it's probably the number of black women professors of architecture. I know maybe six who are tenured, and maybe another five who are tenure track, and maybe another four who are teaching. I mean, it's, we're probably maybe 20 in the entire country. Right, so the, the numbers are incredibly low, and I always refer to it as, you know, when I was an undergrad, as just being a vampire. Like, you never saw yourself reflected, you know, um, within the faculty, you know, within the stuff that you were studying, within, you know, this is part of the reason I ended up at the AA. You know, I, I just had to go somewhere else. Um, yeah, and it does become a, you know, a, a really striking problem, but my, my strategy has always been um, again, find collaborators, find community, find, um, you know, in these projects like Who Builds Your Architecture to kind of, again, look at, like, this thing that is always absent, the labor. Um, that was, that's a collaborative of, of, you know, colleagues, students, former students who've been working on that project. Um, just to, in, in order to kind of generate a body of, of work that can circulate, basically. We produced a, a field, a critical field guide in order to kind of get these ideas these ideas out there. Um, I'm co-editing a volume called Race and Modern Architecture um, from the Enlightenment onward with a group of architectural historians, you know, some of which we sort of had to push like the question of race and that it didn't really work. Um, but again, I mean, that volume is going to be useful for people who are you know, looking at this question or looking for readings for seminars or for, for lecture courses. So, um, you know, so, you know, it's, it's a constant kind of, um, you know, placing all of this sort of you know, whether it's professionally or academically, in order to sort of force change. But like I said, sometimes you, you have to go out. And I would say that most of the black women that I have gone to school with are outside the discipline. I mean, they're still working as artists or curators or, you know, some leave, some come back. But, you know, the ability often, and, and sometimes it's just economic. I mean, the, the ability to kind of graduate in debt um, and then be able to work for low wages is not feasible. So you, you have to go and find something else, right? Because you don't have, you know, the wealth, somebody's not gonna pay off your loans, right? Or perhaps even, you know, um, you know, find someone who's going to be able to help you pay off those loans. So that often produces a kind of um, exclusionary dimension, I think, to the profession. Yeah, just quickly, um, when I was at the AI, that was, <coughs> My job to watch the numbers. So uh, yeah, you're right. It's a half percent a year for the next 40 years, and that would finally get us there. But it's one of the things I always, my wife, again, I refer back to my wife, and I talk about this a lot. And I always tell her, well, I says, well, if you would quit, then the numbers would go faster. So I always tell people to be wary that you don't want to discriminate against older workers. Too, you could actually ask them to leave sooner. That would cause the number to go up faster. So uh, there's a lot of, unfortunately, odd things related to Statistics 101 that uh, are, are not manageable. You know, just, it just can't be managed. But I just want to say to the young lady on in here is that um, uh, <clears throat> there's some really, Tiffany Brown, some really good people out of Chicago in Detroit are doing amazing work on the pipeline side. And I know the pipeline is, yeah, the pipeline, the pipeline, and all that. But, you know, if Tiffany wasn't doing that, you know, now we got 406, 408, 410, 4, you know, it's, it's, it's something, you know, and I just can't change, you know, people will come to me and, and, and like, want me to solve that problem you're talking about tomorrow. I mean, like, Damon, what are you going to do about 409, you know? And, and the thing is, is that it's a tough, when you're in the business of diversity and inclusion, those are really hard days because I know that I can't change it overnight. But then I start thinking about this in some ways is somewhat of a cliche, so I don't want you to take it the wrong way. But when I look at Mae Jameson, okay, that's zero person to look up to. She's the only black woman at that point in her life. And what she has accomplished is something we can all really celebrate. And I don't. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mae Jamison is the first black, uh, sorry, first African American astronaut. You know, and 
she would be a great person to ask that question to, actually, to tell you the truth, because I'd love to know what she was thinking when she had zero mentors, zero role, you know, zero, you know, zero. So, but it didn't stop her somehow, and I don't want it to stop you. I'm looking forward to you being 509 or 5607 or whatever that number is, because every time one more person does it, that's two more people you can pull behind you. That's why it really matters. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a way of, of helping mitigate the, like the issues of it is going back to the fifth question of, of alliance and what that means. Because I, I will become a licensed architect, but I hope throughout the way that it will be in a positive experience from it. So having, a, like having the workspace become a community where everyone feels valued and counteracting biases of, that are embedded within architecture of per, um, perfectionism and paternalism and allowing everybody to have a responsibility and trusting that they will um, come through with it and reach their potential and everyone believes in each other and it will allow people to stay motivated rather than having to having to look towards other um, professions or? Yeah, so real quickly, we, we created uh, a scholarship program at the AIA, which I helped develop that from two scholarships a year. You'd have to say what kind of impact is that, to 20, you know, or, or you know, 14, that's better. But I always told people, it's not the number, it's 20 more leaders. Because the more leaders who are minority, that has a very powerful effect. And I'm looking, I guess I'm looking forward for you to be one of those because that's 10, maybe 10 more people that you can help behind you. And then you can start multiplying that faster. That's how it's going to happen faster when we become leaders. So. Thank you. Um, we, I would like to open the uh, the room for some questions. Um, Michelle, are, are you okay to stay a little bit longer? I, I do plan on having a cocktail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we will have a closing remarks from Dean Addington, um, but uh, if we could open for questions now. Perhaps I'll respond to that, or begin a response, and other people can jump in. Um, I think the, the reason we were using terms uh, in this discussion like masculine and feminine, rather than um, uh, male and female, is um, in part due to the fact that I, I think we're trying to think of the nuanced ways in which um, uh, gender expression is performed by all of us in different ways, and these, in fact, as you are right, are stereotypical uh, sets of um, ways of behaving um, 
crafted in uh, Western culture in particular is what we're talking about. Um, and we're trying to separate that from uh, the, uh, the sex you're assigned at birth um, and the gender you now identify as, as an adult or growing up, um, to, to, to talk about how, yes, indeed, we are all dealing with um, these stereotypical uh, expectations around behavior and appearance and, and presumptions around how we care ourselves. Um, and I think, as some of us have, have talked about, uh, Mabel and, and I, and I think the rest of us, um, we, we are addressing the fact that we uh, architecture has a lot of baggage, um, and it is, you know, historically, and to today, it has um, sort of masculine, stereotypical um, ways of behavior which are, I think, valued and lead to, I guess, uh, progression and success, like speaking over other people, um, uh, having ego. I mean, these are indeed stereotypical things, and they uh, are things that we have to, to address, I think. Uh, so uh, earlier I said, I used the word ego instead of either one or the other, and I said that for a reason. But you know what, I've, I've worked in the offices, as I said, for big firms that are, you know, big bureaucracies, if you will, and uh, I, I, for the last 20 years, I just don't, I, let me just say it this way, I have not really worked with, say, for example, a female who felt, who was basically using masculinity as a way to, to make it. Because I think what's happened over the years is, is we, I've tried to emphasize as well that uh, it's a call, it's called a effective manner of communication. So what that means is that every person has a style that they have to manage and cultivate in order to be successful in the way they want to communicate. For some people that male or female, that's this intense intensity method. But um, I think what we're seeing now is the intensity method or the loudness and all that is not, it's just one way to do that. And now we are free to, to explore other ways to communicate with people in order to achieve what our, all our goals are. And I just bought into that and I, I really believe it. And, and I use it. Because it's just you just don't need to be the meanest person or the loudest person in order to make things. And it could be a contractor's meeting or something. But I can I can zing that with just a couple of words without yelling and, and get what I need if I if I need it. So. Thank you for your question. I I hope that answered it. Um, so, any other questions? I don't know that it's necessarily a question. One is just a thank you, because I've been to several panels that talk about equity, gender, um, work-life balance, and the conversation ends up being the same in the end, where a bunch of women are talking about how hard it is to have children and family lives, where you all gave specific solutions to potential problems that we have, instead of just having this conversation where white males need to be present and be a part of the conversation. Um, and you're actually trying to come up with ways to execute them instead of it just being about talk and actually more about action. So thank you for that. And then something that was said earlier, it just keeps, I'm constantly watching how my, I don't mean to put my family on the spot, but watching how my dad is in his marriage versus how he is in raising his daughters and how systemically it actually kind of starts at home. Maybe not so much with the new generations of dads that are coming up, but they're definitely raising their daughters to be strong, independent women in the workplace, but they treat their wives completely different and expect them to be a certain way as their partner versus how they want their daughters to be in the world. And that translates into the work environment big time. And you get treated not so much like the daughter that you're raising, 
but you see them more because maybe they're the same age or whatever, they treat them more in that power dynamic I'm noticing than how if all of the men just kind of treated the women as if they were daughters, everyone would be empowered and everybody would be happy, right? But that's, that's not what's happening. Um, so like I said, it's not just really a question, it was just something that a lot of the conversation made me think about. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I just respond. I mean, I think what, what I like about kind of Grace's uh, list is it stuff that we can do. Um, because one of the things that always annoys me um, about older folks is <laughs> always like, oh, well, the youth will fix it. And it's like, no, that's not their responsibility, right? I think they should be mindful that even maybe at the moment it looks, particularly in college, you think the playing field seems to look very equal. But actually, as soon as you get out the door, there you'll see how opportunities, privileges will kick in and certain people can do this, other people are gonna have to work a lot harder to get there. And I think we have to, one, be mindful of that, but I think those of us who you know, have to work to still fix the system, we cannot rely you know, just just on, oh, they're going to make, you know, I think that was Greta Thunberg's point. It's like, don't look at me to fix your mess. Fix your, you know, like, we, we, we have to work at these issues because they're they're structural. Um, are you familiar with the Canadian group, Baroness Von Sketch? You have to look it up. Um, Google Baroness Von Sketch Summit. Um, and they do one skit in which basically all the women um, have taken over the world and they're having their global summit. And the global summit, which would normally take, you know, three months, is taking now, you know, three hours or, or less. And they go around the room and they hit all these issues. And it's hilarious. I mean, I wish we could pull it up here because it's very uplifting. But what I love about Baroness Von Sketch is that, especially in that summit um, skit, is that they actively um, absorb stereotypical qualities of women, of femininity, or, or characters that you assign to the feminine voice, or to, the, to, to femininity, and they, they leverage it to demonstrate what the world might be like if, in fact, we and gave in to women in power with all of their the tropes of their characterization of being actually people who talk and work it out and, and um, uh, uh, sleep on it at night and you know whatever all these things that you and it is it's just delightful because um, I really hope you 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 look at it because I do think that it lends um, a kind of very optimistic way of understanding uh, it is poking fun at it of course but at the same time it reveals. Um, the, a kind of very sanguine approach to how we might think about um, feminine, masculine, and, and in fact how it's empowered as opposed to. Anyway. Oh, um, I actually, uh, since Grace mentioned um, uh, a pay disparity um, earlier um, between uh, men and women, um, thinking about men and women in this very binary way, but um, there is. Uh, Looking at the SFAIA report from 2018, Equity by Design, at every single level of um, a, a woman, somebody who identifies as a woman's career, there is always a pay differential, and the, the woman is always paid less than, than, the, than somebody who identifies as a man. And even at the latest, uh, at the most senior level of a woman's career, there is a 20% pay gap between men and women. That is a senior level career, like a principal running a firm. And that um, matters in the academy as well. Exactly, and in terms of like your comment about perhaps practical ways to maybe address some of these issues, something that I think we really need to be more open about is actually telling each other how much we get paid, mm -hmm. which is like a very perhaps uncomfortable and thing to do, and it certainly makes the people who are paying you very uncomfortable. Um, you know, I don't, but, um, you know, in terms of like what your peers are getting paid, like ask them like how much are you getting paid, ask your coworkers how much they're getting paid, they may not tell you, 
Um, but uh, that's one way that you can start to ask like the people above you, hey, you know, I have 10 years more experience than Josh over here, and uh, I'm getting paid significantly less money, and I should get a raise. Uh, I have friends who've actually done this and have gotten raises um, at corporate firms such as like SOM and uh, HDA. Just a comment about that. So I mean, I think something like the architecture lobby has really taken that on. Yeah. It's to sort of make visible, you know, again, mm -hmm. like these things. Right? And, I, and I absolutely agree, sort of talking about like that. Because then you start to really see the structural, you know, the kind of structural inequalities about who gets paid what. And we should, we should know these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, uh, for the young people in the room, there actually is a pay calculator online that the AIA has. So you can actually find out what everyone in your region at your level is making. Actually, you can find out what it is. And, and uh, I've had a couple of principals come to me and say, oh my God, thanks, Damon. Now I have to pay my people more money. <laughs> so uh, the last thing, I, I guess we have no time. We keep saying this last thing. But uh, I, this is not a plug, but the AI just <laughs> came up with the, uh, uh, the equity guides for practice, guides for equitable practice, and uh, that was my project when I was there for the first three chapters with uh, Renee Shang out of University of Minnesota, who's now dean at uh, University of Washington. She took on the project after my uh, tenure was over to finish the last six chapters, and the last six chapters were released last month. And I just started reading some of those six chapters today, but they have a specific tools about how to deal with all these situations in great detail, like how to negotiate, how to deal with unconscious bias, how there's all these how-tos and little workshops you can create around them and how, so I would definitely suggest that uh, that as a reading uh, to understand what these action items can be. Okay, if we have any additional questions, let, we can take them after maybe mingling, but don't leave just yet because Dean Addington has some closing remarks for us. Dealing with race, but it was a crack of 
realizing that I didn't even begin to understand how different people's lives were being framed, how different people's lives were being compared against a baseline. And from that point, I become I became a much keener observer of what was going on around me. Uh, I'd listen in on conversations that would talk about, for example, someone we might want to hire. This is after I, I, I moved into the architecture world. And often, in a, and I don't know if this ever happened to you, Grace, but particularly if it was a husband and wife firm, and we were talking about the wife, uh, the question would always be, how do we know it's her work? I never heard anyone say that when they were talking about the male partner of the firm. You know, no, never once did anyone say, how do we know he's the one who did the work? But every time it was a female partner, it was like, we're not even sure what she does in the firm. What, what, what part of the work is hers? Uh, in promotion cases, I would hear someone talk about the fact that, you know, she's great. Uh, she's got all these qualities that we want, but there's this one lack. You know, this one thing is missing. On the other hand, they talk about a guy or someone they really wanted, and they go, yeah. <laughs> and it'd be like, well, he doesn't have this, he doesn't have that, he doesn't have, but he's really good at this one thing. And so what I realized is that it was who owned the framework, who owned the baseline. And, and the reality is, if you look at this, you can, you can parse it down in many different ways. You can see what happens in a studio review when the person who draws most like the professor will be that baseline, and everybody will be compared against it. So, you know, it's not just gender, it's not just race, it's not just ethnicity, it's not just class. It actually can sort of move in all these directions. What the common denominator is, is that that power identifies what that baseline is. And of course, when you start thinking about it in terms of a power dynamic, uh, you also realize, yes, that power also associates itself with certain, uh, with, with gender, with race, and so on, but it doesn't mean that the dynamics are necessarily essentialist. That they're, they're ones that exist in many cases because of power on that. And so fighting against it or acting against it means operating within that power structure. And sometimes that's sort of a, a battle where we have to beat our, our heads against the wall on that because if you don't have power, that's a very difficult thing to act against. And there's really sort of two paths we can think about. And, and the first path is actually stewardship. Those in power have got to see themselves as a steward of opening up that conversation and redefining what that baseline and what that framework is. Um, and that's, that might be pipeline, which probably is not going to be as much as we want, but it's also in terms of things like this that gets that conversation out there more, because if we can create in a group that has power, more of that ability to observe, to be aware, to truly listen, to truly think about what they consider to be that standard, that framework, that's when we begin to act, but it's to be the stewards of others and ensuring that type of sort of fairness and openness in it. But the other thing that came up, which I thought was very interesting, I think, uh, Damon, you mentioned this, and it's sort of related very much to this last set of questions that you all are asking, uh, had to do with intervention. You know, if we may sort of move very slowly on that stewardship front, so then it demands certain layers of intervention. What indeed are those interventions? And I think this is what's sort of fantastic about this group is that's what you were closing with, sort of the idea of the moment in which you find action that's tangible action that I can actually turn a switch. Uh, the pipeline is not going to turn the switch. Um, stewardship, yes, we need to, to sort of take that on is not going to turn the switch, but it's, it's at least sort of the right kind of thinking to have. But what the interventions are, are those moments in which the switch gets turned. And I think that's what we have got to start articulating what those switches need to be. Um, one of the things that was so remarkable about this event, uh, and I think those of you who are visiting the school for the first time will recognize that we have awesome students here. 
this is the second one of these events that, that they've, uh, they've worked on and they've, they've co-organized. Um, you know, and I think, I'm ashamed that all the symposia I put on in my life, and I put on many, don't hold a candle to, to what the students are able to put together. Um, you know, the other part of it is that uh, what's really exciting as well is Leora as the new managing director of our Center for American Architecture and Design uh, had a series of, of initiatives that she wanted to bring forward. This was something really important to Leora and it's also something that she worked quite closely with AIA Austin. We have great partnerships with AIA Austin, so a, a big shout out to Ingrid Spencer and to Chris Noak uh, for, for supporting this. He's the incoming director, uh, I believe, yeah, for that. Um, that's one of the things that's amazing about the school, it's also amazing about Austin, are the kinds of partnerships, um, the intersections that we have with all groups of people within here, all people that support the types of professions uh, that we deal with, all aspects of education on this. Um, there are many things for us to do as we move forward. There's a lot of hard work for us uh, moving forward on it, but we have an unbelievable community here. And it's, it's an honor to be part of it, but it, the, the real thanks actually go to all of you who've worked so hard, who you know, shared your stories with us, uh, who asked like effing amazing questions uh, <laughs> that I'm not used to seeing. Uh, Mabel and I have sat on a couple of these things before Grace and I have, have talked about this before. I've not seen questions at this level uh, ever before. Um, so I do have one important announcement to make moving forward. There is going to be a after conference gathering at the, is the Cactus Club? Cactus, <laughs> that's something else right now. <laughs> questions to be asked um, uh, for, for uh, under 21 I'm sure there's some sparkling water stuff there <laughs> and for others a, a cocktail to enjoy but uh, I hope to see you over there and Leora any last words that you want to share with everyone just about cocktails which is that also the AIA women in architecture committee will be there and their hope is to engage with you all and continue the conversation with them I think they want to share their experience you in the, in the profession and how, how they got where they are. So it's a great opportunity for students to kind of continue the conversation with professionals who are out there and make those connections. Thank you. Thank you.